Mm-hmm.
moved. So Chandler, can you hear me? Hi, you have to unmute yourself. Yes. How are you doing? Good evening. I, yeah. I've, I've met you before, right? Yes, yes. Exactly yeah, you, in one of the oh, yeah, I remember. Hey, uh, you, you remember how to screen share, right? Yeah. OK, so you're a veteran. Not a veteran like you, but yes, I know the tricks. Well, if you, <laughs> It's like, you know, if a surgeon spends time with an instrument, you get to know it, that's all. Yeah. You know, it's like almost holding in your hand, get used to holding so it, the, the way, so the way and you know, how it works and stuff. Same thing as a surgical instrument. Surgeons have now become computer techies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, hey, if it helps, it helps, you know. Yeah, it really helps. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll start in about seven minutes, okay? Yeah. Now, this time it's going to be different. We're going to have some people here. The last time, I don't think there were many, there were people watching, but not in the panel. Yes. yes. But now people have nothing to do, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're in lockdown too, probably, right? You're in Mumbai? Yeah. No, I'm in Hyderabad. Oh, that's right, okay. And you don't have videos, right? Yeah, I have. I do have videos. Okay, do the videos uh, have sound or uh, no? No, no, no. Oh, they don't okay. have sound. Okay, it might be tough because your bandwidth is not that good. Do you want to test it? you want to test the video now? Uh, I did test it and it looks yeah. yeah, Yeah, sure, we could try it, but I want to be prepared in case it it's too big bandwidth. You know? uh, no, no, these are small ones. And even if it doesn't play, it's fine. It's okay. Okay, don't worry about that. Don't worry yeah. about it. Don't worry about it. Okay. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You won't go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, eventually, we'll, I'm going to ask all the panelists to help me. Like, for example, like now, I'm going to say, mm -hmm. get on your smartphone. Matter of fact, we could try it right now, all the panelists. And also, well, you too, uh, Suchanda. Get your yes. smartphone. Start. A, you know how to do a Facebook Live? Uh, I haven't done one. Okay. Just go to, I'll, I'll tell everyone. Go, okay, Roberto, you too. Just go to Facebook Live, go to Facebook and there's a live video. Mm, I went to Facebook, but how do you do a live video? Yeah, you just touch the live video button, like I'm going to do with mine right now. I'm going to, and any panelists can follow me because we got to get the, the panelists to work for free. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me, let me, uh, let me, let me start one myself. So I'm, okay. Good job. So I'm, I'm going, hey, Roberto, start a Facebook Live. Okay, so what I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing, I've touched the button, live video, and then it says start live video. I'm touching it, and I'm saying, hey, all my followers, uh, we're having a webcast now on uh, Neurosurgical TV. Uh, 
Suchandra is going to talk about uh, epilepsy uh, surgery, I believe, as well as uh, Tool Goel. So we'll see you there. See, I just made a Facebook Live video you for the panelists that go to all of my followers. And Manas, you probably understand that, right? No. Yeah, hi, Manas. You understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just make a short video and, and send it to your followers now. And say, hey, I'm in the, you know, I'm in. A, I'm going to be in a webcast. Come, come see us. Do you know what I mean? Before, before that, anyway, I'm not going to do that, otherwise I'll confuse. Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't Let the others do. It's just some <laughs> more. It's just I'm nothing, so I don't need to do that exercise. No, no problem. No, no problem. Is it three minutes? Just let me let a few more people in and then I'll start. See how good. Okay, we're going to start. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning. It's Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach. Uh, we have the pleasure today of having Suchandra Bhattacharjee, uh, uh, who is going to speak to us today about epilepsy surgery, ticks, trips of the trade. And I'll turn it right over to you because you've done this before and you're a veteran. And welcome and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. I thank the whole academic team of uh, neurosurgeons in Neurosurgical Coach for giving me this opportunity. And also I thank uh, my mentor, Dr. Manas, who has recommended, I know. And so a big thanks to him as well. So I'll share the screen now. Today we'll be talking about epilepsy surgery. It's not sharing. Take your time. Yeah, you're not. How come you'll, it's not? you'll get it. You'll get it. Okay. It's 
it's not sharing somehow. Not yet, not yet. Okay, you, you click the uh, share button, and then yeah, you I gotta yeah, then you gotta pick the screen. The screen is not coming. Oh, you'll get it. Don't worry. We can always edit this out. Hello, Manas, could you uh, lead us through? Uh, Are you there? Man yeah. Go ahead, Manas. Yeah, I'm there, I'm there. Go ahead, Manas, just lead us through, uh, please. You, can, uh, you have a set, did you click on the set screen? Before? Yeah, I have done that, I have done that. Uh, then, desktop, uh, desktop. On the desktop, you have opened your uh, PowerPoint or uh, you're not done? Yes, 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 I have opened that as well. Uh, means that slide you have to click on that again. On the desktop, you have to click on that again. There will be three, four windows. No, the on your slide you have to click. No, it's showing okay, desktop. Let, okay, let, let's start from the beginning. Okay, now there's a share screen button at the bottom, correct? Yeah, I have done that. Okay, and then the screen opens up, and, and there are it's showing of... allows them to share your screen. Okay, okay, pick the screen you want to share and then click start share. Uh, there's a button at the bottom of that. No, something is happening wrong here. Okay, no, uh, yeah. can no, do you, you take your phone no, and just show the screen to me in, in WhatsApp? I have done it quite a bit of time, but yeah, yeah. Mm, send. <laughs> Okay, so the screen. Yes, your one is coming. My one. Can you give me the screen? You are already sharing the screen. No, no, you are actually you are seeing the video. You minimize it. Sorry? No, you are seeing all the video screen. Uh, this is right. Can you show me again down? Down. Yeah. You know, the, uh, Manas, she could send you the PowerPoint and you could share it. Okay. If you want to do that, that might work. Coming as your screen, okay. I don't know why. My screen? Yeah. No, yeah. no that videos, you, have to, you, you are seeing the videos, you need to go to the screen. Right? Uh, see, and uh, there is a gallery, you know. Ga you have clicked the gallery. That's why it's coming. Where, where, where? Where, where, where? On the right where, top where, corner, there is a ga gallery. You click on that. No, there's nothing coming in the gallery. No, when I use Okay, let's we'll start from the beginning again. Okay, so turn off the phone, please. Turn off the phone. Okay, go to the go to the share screen button. Okay. Okay, turn off the phone, please. Turn off the phone. So yeah, go to the share screen, click on share screen. Another big yeah. screen opens up. Pick yes. the screen you want to share and then click share. Okay, try that. There you go. Okay, there yeah, you go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now make it bigger. Make it bigger. Yeah, you, that I do. Yeah. Now you, okay, you're on the right you track. Got it? You're on the right okay. track. Yeah, okay. There okay. you go. There, perfect. Sorry, okay. Something was not working. Okay. On, onward. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start right away. Uh, yes, sorry please. for the delay. We'll just uh, go with the epilepsy surgery. And uh, I'll try to cover all the common surgeries which we do. And uh, what's wrong? Okay, so epilepsy surgery is a teamwork and we, have, we need to have a team and only when there is a cohesion, cohesion between the team it works. This is my team where I work with. There's a neurologist, the radiologist, the nuclear medicine doc, all of them are 
required to have a proper epilepsy surgery and a successful epilepsy surgery program. So you might be wondering, why did I put a picture of a cake here? So what is the rule of neurosurgeon to a cake? It's just like, you know, you put an icing on the cake. The cake is being baked by the neurologist. They do all the hard work. They do the selection. And then you come and do the icing you're doing the surgery. But of course, you need to have the skills of doing the icing. And then you get a very good result. So that is how a team works in epilepsy surgery. So a little bit about history of epilepsy during the time of the Roman Empire, actually Jesus was thought to be evoked by evil spirits. The illness in the past time was thought to be a sacred disease. Epilepsy is one of the most common neurological disease affecting up to 2% of the population. And there are a few questions which has to be asked before you subject the patient to an epilepsy surgery. Is the seizure focus identified with acceptable confidence? Is it's safe to remove the known seizure focus in terms of neurological outcome. Therefore, it is important to comprehensively evaluate the patient whether they meet specific selection criteria. And if the above questions are answered, you can perform epilepsy surgery. So where do you do epilepsy surgery? You do in cases where there is failure of uh, drugs to act on the disease. So how do you define a drug resistance? Failure of adequate trials of two tolerated and appropriately chosen and used anti-epileptic drug schedules, whether as a single drug or in combination to achieve sustained shiz of freedom. Duration is roughly around two years in adults or even less and six months or even less in children with catastrophic epilepsis. This is given by the ILE. So, but then there is a highly underutilization of epilepsy surgery. Less than 5% of all eligible patients are opting for surgery. Why is it so? Because there is still negative attitudes of patient towards brain surgery, potential candidates being enrolled into trials for new EADs, certain uncertainty among physicians about the safety and efficacy, underestimated benefits and overestimated risks, resulting in delayed referral to almost 20 years. Of course, this has uh, reduced now, but still there are long delay be between the disease and that is one. So let me talk a little bit about the prevalence. It is a chronic brain disease, 60 million affected worldwide, around 34 to 76 per lakh new cases being added annually. So you can see the huge burden over the globe, 20 to 30% medically refractory, 40 to 50% of this medically refractory group respond to surgery. 80% are actually in the developing world and 80 to 90% receive inadequate or no treatment at all. I'm from India and the statistics in my country are somewhat like this. 10 million people are affected, 3 million are drug resistant, 1 million require roughly epilepsy surgery. So if you look at the current status, this is a data published in 2017, we have around 50 centers more or less doing epilepsy surgery and around 8,000 being done annually. And this was way back in 2017, some more centers has been added. So a little bit more is being done annually. But if you look at it, only two in thousand eligible patients in India also undergo epilepsy surgery because of which there is enormous surgical treatment gap in the country. So now let us come to how do you choose a case? Where do you stand? So you stand in the rat category. We surgeons stand here because when only the drugs fail and the patient becomes resistant to the medical treatment, we offer them surgery. And what are the different types of things you offer them? It could be a resective surgery. It could be a palliative where the VNS comes in, or it could be again a medical treatment with multiple drugs. So what are the protocol before subjecting the patient to surgery? Clinical examination, video EEG, MRI in epilepsy protocol, and optional might or might not be required with PET scan, ictal spec, functional MRI, DTI, and water test. Water test almost phased out now, replaced by functional MRI. But the most important is the concordance between VEG and imagiology and semiology. And of course, the mandatory discussion and agreement in epilepsy surgery institutional meeting. 
So algorithms of pre-surgical evaluation remains if you suspect an epilepsy or a mimicus of epilepsy, it has to be a refractory one. Refractory, then do a pre-surgical evaluation, then you do a video EG, then you come to some sort of hypothesis like whether it is a temporal or it is an extra temporal or it is a generalized epilepsy or it is just a pseudoschism. If it is temporal, you have to further classify whether it is from the mesial structures or from the neocortical structures. Extra temporal, it could be frontal, parietal or occipital. So this is uh, somewhat a guideline of how we proceed about if it is a mesial temporal, which is the most common one, which is the most common one of uh, pro causing epilepsy, then we have to do an MRI and sorry, we do an MRI and video EG. If they're concordant straight away subject to surgery, MRI is negative, video EG positive, either on the right or the left side, PET scan and nictil spec concordant subject to surgery. Bilateral MTS, one side is more than the other. Video EG is lateralizing. Go for surgery, not lateralizing. You need an invasive monitoring and then you have to go for surgery. Same for extra temporal MRI and video EG confirmation is there. Can go for surgery, video EEG is positive, but uh, MRI is negative, then you can do a PET or SPECT scan. If it is positive, go for surgery. If not, you have to do an invasive monitoring. That is how in this protocol we move around. So what are the invasive monitorings available? GRIDs, DEPTS, SEEG, MAG. So SEEG, stereo EEG, MAG is magnetic, the magnetic stimulation. So these are the available things. I'll not go into the details. I'll go into the surgical part. And this is how uh, in a patient where you put a grid looks like post-op uh, in the X-ray, this is how you put, and then you record continuously video EEG for several days before subjecting to surgery. These are the various available grids and strips available. And these are depth. This is almost come not done these days because it has been replaced by stereo AG where you can pull multiple depth electrodes in the temporal, wherever you have the hypothesis of the epilepsy. So if you, the next is, what are the different types of surgery? It could be either temporal, as I have said, or extra temporal. So anatomical sub substrates for this surgery is remain in temporal, it could be lesional or non lesional same or extra temporal. So what are the different approaches? If you look at the approaches, you have many. You have a resective surgery, radio surgery, disconnective surgery, neuroaugmentative, and laser surgery. In resective surgery, temporal lobe resection, or which could be standard or selective, extra temporal resection again, or anatomic or functional hemispherotomy. Disconnective surgery could be corpus callosotomy, hemispherotomy, subpiled transaction, or posterior disconnective surgery. You have radio surgery, you have neuroaugmentative, deep brain stimulation, vagal nerve or restorative nerve stimulation, and laser therapy. But the most important ones and the workhorse of all epilepsy surgery is the temporal lobe resection. And then it comes the hemispherotomy, and then you have the extra temporal resection, basically. Listening. These are the three main surgeries which is commonly done, then the rest are done in few numbers. So if you look at the anterior mesial surgery, most commonly performed surgery, where do you do in a mesial temporal sclerosis, which is the most common cause? What happens? Atrophy of amygdala and hippocampus and histologically mm, neuronal loss and gliosis of CA1 and CA3, sparing the CA2 of hippocampus. And how do you diagnose them? With four A's, abdominal aura, RS, automatisms, and amnesia. So it has the history of temporal lobe surgery a little bit. Rasmussen, goal for a lot of work has been done in Montreal Neurological Institute. And then Penfield came in the picture and then came Neymar who gave us the transcortical uh, selective and then Yesergil who gave us the transylvian. Never though the procedures have evolved over a period of time, but still now the standard anterior mesial temporal lobotomy is the most common surgery performed. So if you look at this surgery, at this uh, analysis which came in 2013 where they did an 18 year follow up of the temporal lobe epilepsy surgery or hippocampal sclerosis in 108 patients and they found that 12 years and 18 is still the seizure free rate was 65 and 62 percent and the risk of recurrence was around 22 percent at two years and 1.4 percent per year selectively and they have also found in the surgery that selective versus anterior temporal lobectomy did not impact on the outcome. So both are same in terms of long-term outcome. Remaining on anti-epileptic drug and history of generalized clonic tonic seizures diminish the probability of remaining seizure free. So this is a very important article which tells us about the long-term goal of epilepsy surgery. 
So let me tell you about this. So since we are in the temporal, so what are the approaches we can have for the temporal? We can have the standard anterior mesial temporal lobectomy. We have the selective one. You can do a radio surgery, you can do a DBS, you can do a laser, radio frequency, or maybe something yet to come. So this is how it looks anatomically. This is a standard one where you connect the anterior part, you take it out. This is the basal and basal view. And this is uh, how you remove the mesial structures. And here only the, this part of the structure is removed in a selective one. This looks very good, but overall outcome is good, but this is difficult to perform. This is relatively easier to perform. So in anterior mesial, you do a removal of the anterior neocortex and amygdala and hippocampus. Neocortex around three and four, but I do three centimeter on both the sides. What do you do? You remove the anterior two third of hippocampus, lateral two third of amygdala, parahippocampus and the uncus. So this is one lateral view, anatomical view. This is what you remove. And this is the medial view. So this is a case where you can see, you can see there is a temporal hippocampal sclerosis, both the sides, you can see this size is more um, intense on the flare. And here you can see the sclerosis here. Again, I'll take you a better picture. And here you can see in this case, you can see here, you can see compared to the hippocampus here is completely flat and there also look for the other flex signs like the mammillary bodies. What you can see is slightly smaller than on the right side. Also look at the fornix here, it looks pretty good, but many times the fornix is actually thinner on the side. And of course you have the hyper intensity on the flare. So these are the red flag signs. These are the core signs how to diagnose a, uh, mesial temporal sclerosis, and this is a post op image where you can see it has been. So, this is how the post op image looks like where you spare the superior temporal gyrus most of the centers. Many people prefer to take it out, but we do spare it until unless required, we don't remove it. And this is the post op picture how it looks. So, in how do you do the procedure? You put the patient in the supine just like you do an aneurysm surgery and with little extension and you turn the head 45 to 60 degrees. Some people turn it completely 90, but I think 45 to 60 is enough because the hippocampus falls in line with your vision. And this is how you do it. You reflect the flap anteriorly. You do the craniotomy and this is the dural picture exposure after craniotomy. And then I will show this, then this, you take out this part of the temporal lobe, which I had shown earlier also. Once you remove, you have, I'll show you a video, but just for anatomy, once you remove the cortex, so this is what you see. You see the choroid plexus. You will see this is the choroid plexus, the choroid fissure. This is the fimbria, and this is the hippocampus sitting on the parahippocampal gyrus, and here remains the uncus, and below it, here remains the amygdala. So many times, the problem here are that you might not be able to find the temporal horn. In that case, either you were too anteriorly dissecting or you were too medial or laterally. And so what do you do when you, do, when you don't find the temporal horn? So there are many other ways to find it. You, find, you follow the collateral sulcus. After resection of the anterior te lateral temporal lobe, you, after removal of the uncus, it will open into the tip of the temporal horn. Use that, or you can use a navigation. You can remember a simple tip is that the average distance from the depth of the collateral sulcus to the temporal horn is around three to six mm. So what are the steps of anterior mesial temporal lobectomy, cortisectomy, opening of the temporal horn, identifying choroid plexus, hippocampus, amygdala, or uncus, removing uncus and amygdala, mobilizing the hippocampus, coagulating the hippocampal arteries, and then of course, up by excision of the hippocampus, and here you end, and then you'd have the hemostasis. So I'll show you a short video of this one, of whatever I've said, how we do it. So this is, you are opening the dura, yeah, yeah. The anteriorly, you are reflecting anteriorly, you mark the temporal, you mark the part to be excised, the medial and the inferior temporal lobe, and you take it out sparing, this is the sylvian fissure, this is the superior temporal lobe, you take the temporal lobe, once you take out, next step, as I told, is finding the, uh, is so finding the temporal horn, you can see this is the temporal horn here, the CSF, you can see, you could see the choroid plexus. Sometimes we put depth electrode to verify, and you see that's the glistening white hippocampus where you put a depth electrode. You might not put as well also. It's an individual choice. And then you do the, then you mobilize that this one. I'll show you a second video where you, I'll show you how you remove the, uh, 
Okay, this is the hippocampus. I, this is the hippocampus. You can see here, you have to mobilize on the medial side along the fibria. You have to keep your choroid plexus as the landmark. Yes, Okay, choroid plexus. So this is the choroid plexus. See, so this is the choroid plexus, and just lateral to you find the thin fimbria, and that is where you actually just take a small micro scissor or a micro hook, and that does the job. This is the lateral side which I am doing right now. You can just do a subfile dissection and mobilize the hippocampus. See, the whole hippocampus comes out like this, and. Uh, So this is the lateral side. I'll just first forward a little bit on the lateral side, and then you have on the medial side. Same way. Yes. Okay. See the whole head of the hippocampus coming out here. You see. Yeah, that, that's what here you can see. I am using a small micro, micro hook and then we are removing the hippocampus. And once we have mobilized from the medial and the lateral side, look for the hippocampal arteries. This is the hippocampal artery you can see here. And they come straight as a branch from the PC. So you have to be very careful. You have to very gently dissect them and just near the hippocampus, you have to coagulate and cut them. You cannot tear them because if they start bleeding and you go on, it goes on retracting, you may go and injure the PCA below. So that part you have to be very careful. Once that is done, you just cut the tail and the hippocampus come out in one piece. You should remember this. It is better not to use a Q sign to remove the hippocampus because you look the, the histological structure is destroyed. Okay, so here I'm showing you, see how you take out this, uh, these are the arteries, you have to coagulate it slowly and then only you can remove the hippocampus. So, at the end, you have a picture like this. This is the PCA. You can see underneath the pia. You can sometimes see the third nerve. Sometimes you don't see. It. And sometimes you breach this pia and where you have to be very careful. One tip remains that if you breach the pia, you may you are always scared that you will enjoy the underlying vascular structure. So what you do is, what I do is I put a surgery cell over there. The surgery cell discolors and then it gives you a landmark that, okay, you, uh, that is there. That remains as a safety barrier. This is the vessel vein of Rosanthe. So this is how the hippocampus comes out. You should try to take out in one piece because then the histo the pathologists will not yell at you because they need to know the structures of CA1, CA3, CA2 because to diagnose MTS, these are all required. So this is another case of, a, you can see a cavernoma bleed here, a cavernoma, the same approach was used and the patient is scissor free now six years where the cavernoma was removed. This was a lesional case. So now let's come to extratemporal lobe epilepsy. Extratemporal, the major stay remains the lesionectomy for small lesions. I'll explain by this case, who is a 10 year old male who had a nine year duration of epilepsy, frequency one to two per day. He had a flexion of his right knee, a semiology and become static and uses, I purposely did not include the video ages because it takes a lot of time and for support and behavioral errors, no generalization of seizure was there. There is an abnormal sleep and awake EG, secondary generalization. He was on four drugs when he came to us. This was his MRI. You can see a small gliatic changes. And this was a calcification here, which was responsible for the, his epilepsy. So we decided to take it out. And uh, here you can see, here you can see. So we decided to take it out. So I, I, I chose those cases where I can show a complication as well in the same go. So this was a case where we had a small complications. Once we opened it, we have seen that this this was saying very obvious, so we thought, and uh, this is the correct one, so we took it out, but there was a big vein there, and we took it out, but then the post of MR, a post of CT scan showed the calcium remaining just so as it is, so we took him again on the second day, and then we could remove this huge chunk of calcified material from his brain. And then, but then this was not without any damage. There was a small cortical vein in fog. Patient became hemiparetic, but improved over seven days time. There was a small cortical thrombosis. So later, when you went back and saw the image, you can see that whole vein got thrombosed actually because of the manipulation, which we did on the first surgery. But then he very well improved subsequently. 
and we had a good time. This was another case where we had a lot of difficulty. Here comes the um, benefit of, I wanted to say, of consensus meeting. This was a case, again, a calcification here, but the reports were all like abnormal awake video EEG with left temporal focus to really clinically was what was given in the report. Then PET scan was shown, was showing hypometabolism, hyper both the temporal lobe as well as the parietal lobe. Lobe. And then, of course, we had the ictal semiology, which was favoring a left temporal CPS with secondary generalization. We had the MRI report, which was showed normal study of the brain. So we were really confused. So there were two focus for us. So we decided to go with the uh, by exercising. Yeah. Yeah. Exercising the classification, and once and we thought that in the second stage, if the seizure does not subside, we will go for. Uh, second surgery of uh, anterior temporal lobectomy were subsequently now seven years down the lane just removal of that small speck of calcium the patient is doing absolutely fine so next come is the category of disconnection this has also become quite popular and they are usually used in the the lower surgeries. So it has evolved over a period of time from resective to disconnective surgery. Hemispherectomy was done as early as 1928 by Dandy, and then came decortication by Busey and Nick Lancy in 1968, and then functional hemispherectomy by Rasmussen, and then hemispherectomy. Various uh, neurosurgeons contributed in its development and evolution by Dillalande, Schramm, Willemore, and Shimizu and Mahara. So if you look at it, how it went. Earlier, there was a large tissue removal. We called it hemi anatomic hemispherectomy. Then came partial removal. We call it functional hemispherectomy. Then came a small removal, but an extended disconnection where you work on the white matter. Then it has a lot of variations uh, like sperisylvian hemispherotomy, transylvian hemispherotomy, and the extensive disconnection and minimal removal of tissue with the central or vertical hemispherotomy. I'll show you a case of the last one. So hemispherotomy, you have microscopy or endoscopy, which was pioneered in India actually by, from Ames. And uh, I will show that uh, of an example of that, Dillalande's uh, way of doing a, a vertical hemispherotomy. Now we have to know that disconnective surgeries, most of them are for preventing seizures and effective for almost up to 56 to 91 percent of patients become schizophrenic. free. Disconnective surgery is in majority, not a palliative surgery, but how do they work? Disconnective procedures are based on the concept that interacting the epileptiform discharge or spreading pathway and isolating the primary epileptogenic zone would have the same effect as removing the epileptiform focus. So what are the various types we have? We have hemispherotomy, we have posterior disconnection, we have multiple subpile resection, disconnection, hypothalamic hematoma, lobule disconnection, corpus callosotomy, tailored disconnection, like the frontal disconnection or the hippocampal transection. So this is an example of an 18 year old girl who had first in birth or the normal siblings and development had the fever, altered sensorium, meningitis, and after that developed a sequelae of right hemiplasia. She also developed a dystonic movements of the right upper limb and lower limb. And these episodes occur predominantly during daytime and they lasted for a few minutes to hours. So this was the case history. And this is uh, her EEG. You can see that the left side is packing. We cannot show the run of EEG here. So this was the MRI. You can see the left side is all destroyed and atrophic. So we decided to do, and she already had a deficit of um, right um, hemiparesis. And uh, so we did a functional MRI and we saw that all has been shifted to the opposite side. And then we plan for a, uh, this one video EEG. I will not, uh, I wanted to show the video EEG is not playing here. So I wanted to, I'll anyway skip it. So we plan for a hemispherotomy. So in hemispherotomy, this is, uh, this is how you do a classical one. This is a classic, you can now we do a little bit smaller. This was one of the first cases where we did a, a large, this is a large scan, but anyway, this all remains within the hairline. So the patient, in our places, patients are not very skeptical about keeping the hair. So many times they remove the hair uh, voluntarily, we give them an option. So we have done, this is how the incision is being taken. And then around 10 centimeter of the craniotomy of the is done. And then I'll explain you theoretically on an MRI, what are the cuts being done? You remove the corpus callosum. Either you can do through interhemispheric approach or you can do parasitically like this. Okay, 
and then you do a frontal cut at the base and then you do a lateral cut and you do a posterior cut on the sagittal this is how you go about okay so So this is this was uh, the lady which I have showed the history. This was the her case, and here you can see here we did not go. We knew the brain was completely bad, so we decided for a parasagittal approach. Sometimes if the brain looks quite good enough, you don't do. And most now of course it's an evolution of a time, and now I also prefer to do interhemispheric. But this was the initial cases where we did uh, this one. We know where I did a parasagittal. The advantage of doing a parasagittal craniotomy. Parasagittal cut corticectomy is that it is much easier to go to the lateral side because you can retract this better and it becomes a little difficult when you go and enter the ventricle through the interhemispheric side. The idea is to enter the cavity of the lateral ventricle, whether you go parasagittal or you go lateral. The tips remain that you remain at the a junction of the superior frontal gyrus and the middle frontal gyrus because it is at that part that is a watershed zone of the artery supplying with the MCA and the MCA, uh, MCA and the ACA. So even if you have an infarct, uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not a significant. So this is how you enter the ventricle. You go deep. It is almost about six to seven centimeter deep from the cortex in most of the case, in average cases. But if you have a megalan carefully, then it is a very big approach and you might have to do a little bit of corticectomy, a lobectomy also of the frontal side. So while you enter the ventricular cavity, like this and from inside out this is the corpus callosum this is the septum see this is the septum and this is the corpus callosum so you start with cutting the corpus callosum here the all the whole segment of corpus callosum is cut right from anterior anterior genu to the splenium okay inside out if you go through here through the interhemispheric part then at the base you find both the callosal arteries but when you go from inside out to the parasagittal part at the base you find the cingulate gyrus so you remove the corpus callosum all throughout i'll forward a little bit more you can start and you go anteriorly like this this is the entry frontal side this is the posterior side this is the lateral side that you have been reflected on the medial side Okay, so I'll just go a little bit anteriorly like this. You go on cutting, 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 cutting. It takes, I don't know. And then you turn medial and laterally. So you see, once you finish, you laterally, you follow the ACA. If you see the ACA and then you go at the base up while you go on cutting the white matter, white matter and go as far as possible as much as you enter the sylvian system like this. This is how you do, but you should remember that you, the tip is that you should remember almost two and a half centimeter anterior to the foramen of Monroe, otherwise you might damage the connective layer. So once you go as lateral as possible, I prefer to put a cotinoid there so that when I come from the lateral side, it becomes easy for me to identify and the whole cut is completed. Okay, now it is very difficult to come this way. So you direct your microscope Posterly here you see the beautiful foramen migram with the choroid plexus coming down. Now you focus your attention below and you come right out to the atrium. After you finish that, you come up to here and uh, your work will be from posterior to anterior. Now I'm completing rest of the corpus callosotomy here and then I will detect and then I'll then this becomes my roadmap, the choroid plexus. I follow it into the temporal hole and uh, you remain lateral to the choroid plexus and go on cutting all the white matter tract here. This is the most difficult cut, I think, because you have to do a little bit of retraction. Once you finish that, you go entirely. And as I put the cotton eye, then most of the time I'm going to go and find it there. So your lateral cut is complete. Once your lateral is complete, you do the posterior cut. From that lateral cut, you just cut straight across up to the splenium. And below you'll find the pia and underneath you can see the great beings uh, below the splenium okay so once this is done now then then the outflow of hippocampus you can cut the hippocampus in the temporal horn or what you can do is the outflow of hippocampus we all know is the fornix so once that is done what you can do is you can just cut the fornix which is very easy to be done then I'll just show you how you cut the fornix is very difficult to appreciate you know on a very small video this thing but we know that uh, the choroid plexus 
Gutes tut was. Okay? So the whole, this is the posterior cut, the whole thing is being done, uh, is being done and you see pyrola. And this, this is the step where you do the fornix. This is the, this is the choroidal fissure. You just take a micro hook and you just puncture. This is the septum and then you see the roof of the third ventricle with its veins. So if you disconnect the fornix, your whole thing is done. Okay, so this completes the surgery. Then you do a vigorous uh, him, um, irrigation and drive away all the blood. You can put a, a drain there and keep it for 24 hours and then your surgery is done and then you close the dura and come out. So this is some steps of hemispherotomy. I'll just go back to, this is the frontal side, just to recap, frontal side, posterior side. This is the choroid, uh, foramen of Monroe, choroid plexus, going the lateral in the cavity and then going in the temporal horn. This is the lateral side, this is the dura reflected medial. So what you do, you start here cutting the corpus callosum, you go entirely cutting the frontal side, then you come posterior, cut this, go this, and then you cut here, and then at last fornix. This is how you do a hemispherotomy. This is the post-operative picture of the girl, and uh, this was after six months or eight months, I forgot, and she was completely okay. She is she's a free, and this was picture was after six months, and this is the MRI, they'll have a subdural collection, but it was not bothering. You can see all the cuts on the MRI, which I have spoken about. This is how you do a hemispherotomy. Now, next is in hypothalamic hematoma, what do you do? Hypothalamic hematoma are rare congenital non-neoplastic lesions of the inferior hypothalamus consists of an abnormal mixture of neural and gyal tissue. They arise from the four of the third ventricle, tuber cinarium or mammillary bodies. And this is a safe procedure, can be classified as sessile or pedunculated. This is an example of a sessile variety, and this is an example of a pedunculated variety. So what are the management? The ideal may be an endoscopic navigated rubber assisted disconnection, but all of us don't have all this armamentarium. So the management remains either resection, radio frequency ablation, disconnection could be either with a laser or microsurgery. So what are the resective surgery? The risk of severe complications, potential complications remain, memory deficit, endocrinological, of course, we are working along the hypothalamus, electrolyte. There could be some motor deficit, oculomotor impairment, I think approximately 50% due to distortion of the hypothalamus many times. You have to keep all this in mind. Laser, 86% patient achieve with good um, outcome, no long-term surgical complication. So it, says, it, it seems to be a very good one. Stereotactic radio surgery, long-term effect of the radiation on the hypothalamic area is really not known. Requires several months to be effective while early seizure control is often necessary to avoid secondary epileptic capillopathy. Microsurgical or endoscopic disconnection. In selected cases, minimal surgical morbidity, dramatic improvement in terms of schiza, striking improvement in attention, behavior, and cognitive development. In this approach, the use of sharp instruments is very important. This is the tip. Disconnection is of paramount importance. The ideal instrument should interrupt the continuity between the hypothalamic hematoma and the hypothalamus with minimal impact on the neural tissue. This last thing is very important. We need to keep in mind. So some tricks are here. The endoscopy, if you use an endoscopy, microcoagulation, unipolar probe, it can produce a micro explosion with gas bubbles, and then that may be difficult. Fogarty velour, <coughs> excuse me, exhaust pressure in any direction with risk to the hypothalamus, which is often already uh, distorted. Ultrasonic probe aspirate a big no-no here. And so the resection how what is the ideal thing and this has been described right by the phoenix group but this is not available anywhere a resector they have developed so then what is best for in general what is best the best is your very own micro scissor and it does the job very good so i'll explain to a girl who is a six-year-old and had frequent episodes of gelastic scissor. Again, this was her hypothalamic hematoma. You can see here, you can see here, you can see this or this. And this was the EEG sample of an EEG. You can see the spikes. And uh, somehow this video is not playing. I will not go into the again. So she had the classical gelastic scissors. This is another girl who again scissors, again 18 year old female and she also had a pre headache followed by laugh and uh, inappropriate laughter and loss of consciousness and then into secondary generalization she had a below average <coughs> IQ and mild invol involvement of her IQ. Um, so this again I'll skip the video age and uh, 
this was her. She had a bigger one, the biggish one. You can see how big the hypothalamic hematoma was. So this is how you operated. We operated on this case, and I would like to show that we did a standard terrional craniotomy. This is the frontal lobe. This is the temporal lobe. Here we go in, and here what you can see is uh, this. You can see the optic chiasm. This is the internal carotid artery. Here is the lamina terminalis. You can see some bulging there. You don't see the translucent lamina terminalis here. Here, here. This is the hypothalamic hematoma as well as you can trace with the optical chiasmatic, uh, optical carotid co optical um, corridor. So you define it here. We defined it from this side as well as using both the corridor, both the corridor of lamina terminalis as well as the optical carotid corridor. And uh, because uh, we wanted to be really sure, we, we could see some distinction from the hypothalamus. We could put some plane here. We tried to put depth electrons almost, but then of course it was not how many times the depth electrode doesn't pick up. But um, since we did it, I'm showing here, we put a depth electrode. There were some spikes, but we don't know whether it was significant or not. Anyway, we could locate it on and using both the corridors of the optic of thalmic as well as uh, the um, lamina terminalis. We gradually proceeded. Let me, sorry, let me just gone back somehow. And then the, we took a sample of biopsy. Otherwise, you are not supposed to pull and push it from the hypothalamus. We looked at a little bit of biopsy, and then it was only the use of micro scissor to cut the whole thing. Most of the time, I used the corridor of. Um, or it character of ophthalmic through this. And then you completely, you can see the completely disconnected it. But then again, this also had a small, very, very funny complication. Once we disconnected it, you just went and sat on the liliquous membrane. And we were not able to pick it up because the basilar was pulsating very high. So we left it there because it was disconnected and we just left it there. And this is how you do it. At the end of the surgery, you will find, you can see, you can see, See here, you can see the liliquous membrane, the completely you can see that, and this is somewhat little bit sitting here, some we could remove it. So the patient did absolutely well after that, but uh, she had a little bit of uh, obesity, which subsided over time. So next is posterior disconnection. Posterior quadrantic disconnection multilobal pathologies comprises 12 to 22% of large epilepsy series in children, 3 to 9% of mixed pediatric adult series. Children with intractable epilepsy due to extensive lesion involving the posterior quadrant, which, involve, which means temporal parietal occipital forms, occipital lobes. And then again, this has also evolved and the heroes of these are Willemore and Peacock, Daniel, Schramm and Offer. They all evolved in the evolution of this surgery and the indications remain scissors occurring in the posterior part of the lobe. So what are, we have two varieties, either parito-occipital or a temporoparito-occipital disconnection. This was a pictorial depiction of how a quadrantectomy was done. The whole lobe was removed beyond the uh, sensory cortex. And this is how a functional is done. It is preserved and only the white matter is disconnected, preserving all the vessels. So this was a boy, actually it's a boy of five, uh, five seizure for five years with five to six duration. And he had all this uh, temporal type seizures with secondary generalization. He had a reduced visual acuity and violet interquadrantinopia, was on four drugs when he came. And he had all the classical patterns for a poster lobe epilepsy. And then you can see the left side, you can see the spikes here. And again, I'll skip the video AG, it's a longish one. And this is how it was after the schism when he had a schism and then it goes into secondary generalization. You can see the every are open. So this was his MRI. You can see the left side is gliotic here. And uh, so this was the diseased one. So we did a posterior resection. This is how the patient is placed fine with head extended. And this is you fix on a male field plane. This is the incision you made. You cut like a burn door and then the craniotomy is done. And then of course, then you uh, mark it and this is the incision mark. It will be very typical because you work at a depth, the uh, video will not show much. So I have skipped the video because you cannot really understand, but you would just cut through the white matter this way. And at the end, you should see something. This is the cut, this is the cut, this is the cut. And uh, this is how it looks post, uh, it should look post-operatively. 
and this is how at poster she's afraid for three years follow up on two antiepileptics now and this is a pictorial depiction of how it should look afterwards on an mri when your gut is appropriate okay so this is how you do. Next is corpus callosum. This is a relatively easier job. First described by in 1940 by Van Wagenen. Then the rapid secondary generalization of seizure. It may lead to identifying a potentially resectable foci, and uh, effective for drop effects primary or secondary GTS. Yes, the medically practical mixed seizure type like the Lennox just taught. Treating team and the family should acknowledge the risk and define the treatment goals. It is not a curative, it is a palliative surgery, and we will only see reduction in the seizure frequency. It cannot serve as a cure of the seizure. So, this is how the corpus callosum is body, genus, planium, and the cut various parts of the brain that join the joint. And uh, this is how the surgery looks uh, like you do a small incision like this, like you do for a colloid cyst, and you go into the corpus callosum. You have to remain strictly in between the two callosal arteries, and then you have to remove the corpus callosum. So, this is I'll explain with an example 15 years history, very aggressive hyperkinetic, and very difficult to manage as per the parents. He was shouting when he was with us in the words. It was we really had to tie and keep him in the bed or sedate him all the time. This was a very bad brain which he had. And we did a corpus callosotomy. I'll show you like it's a standard like you do for colloid cyst. You do a box craniotomy, you remove, you go to the interhemispheric fissure and you open it. Only thing which uh, ideally to remain in mind that you have to be strictly middle or you'll enter one of the ventricle. So even if you enter the ventricle, it's not a big deal, but it is better if you don't enter the ventricle and you do it. See here I entered the ventricle. So I changed my direction and came a little bit more on the lateral side. Sometimes it remains distorted because of you know the shift of the brain because of atrophy. And then you can see this the septum, you can see the two left legs of the septum giving away. This is how we do a colostomy from anterior to posterior. The tips remain that in the anterior part, it is thick. So instead of going from anterior to posterior dissection, you have to do a vertical dissection. Same when you come posteriorly in the splenium part, you have to do a vertical dissection. And this is simple. This is how you do a corpus. You know, in the post-operatively, the patient may remain drowsy for some time, but gradually they uh, come over that and uh, gets back to the normal. So this is how you do a corpus callosotomy. So this is the post-operative uh, MRI. This was the immediate day one, post-op day one. You can see some pneumocephalus, but you can see the cuts here. You can see the cuts here, and also here, the posteriorly, you can see the cuts. So the patient was very cool after that. So with his hyperkinetic behavior as this is, but still he continues to throw scissors at a reduced frequency. Next is multiple subfile transaction described by Frank Morrill and surgical treatment for refractory epilepsy in eloquent cortex, how it works. Selective destruction of short horizontal fiber connections and aims to prevent epileptic form disease. What is done? Horizontal cuts are made at 5 mm interval, 5 mm tangentially in the suspected portion. This are uh, the two instruments, a very small instrument to make the 5 mm cut. And uh, you have to avoid bleeding as much as possible. Ultrasound is useful. And this I borrowed the slides. And here you can see transactional cut swing brain. And here you can see radial cut swing brain. So this is also simple surgery, but you know, it's uh, you have to be very skillful to, for doing this. Next is hippocampal disconnection or transaction, first reported in 206 and advantage 2006 advantage remains the verbal memory can be preserved in left uh, mesial temporal lobe epilepsy without hippocampal atrophy. But how it works, it works just like the subfile transactions. The hippocampal pyramidal cell layer is 2 mm from the surface. So, how do you do? In here, you make 2 mm cuts, 4 mm apart with a ring curator. I haven't done that, but it is, uh, uh, it is done very rarely sometimes when the patient doesn't. Uh, we cannot do a um, complete uh, mesial temporal uh, lobectomy because of the because you might damage the memory or the executive function. In those cases, sometimes people are doing this. Ring cutters of various sizes are used in various parts of hippocampus, like this diagram. You can see, like you make all the cuts here. This is how it looks, and this is taken from the textbook. Actually, I don't have any experience. And uh, 45 cases was run by Shimizu, and he showed a one-year follow-up of 78% angel class one, 11% class two, and subsequently. And all cases, preoperative virtual levels of memory, six months follow-up or same. 
some patients do develop hippocampal atrophy after six months. But it's not a very popular one. Next comes palliative treatment is vagal nerve stimulation. VNS therapy was uh, approved as early as 1997. It's a pacemaker-like device with science mild intermittent electrical pulses to lead to the left vagus nerve. Placement is a low-risk outpatient procedure. Infection may occur in the incision site. There could be paralysis of the vocal cord, but it is usually transient. Rarely as this tool has been reported. Lid fracture can occur occasionally seen in weeks, months, and years post-operatively. Vagus nerve stimulation, this is a study in 347 patients, and they studied up to 24 months. And they found that in children with drug-resistant epilepsy is very well tolerated and no new safety issues were identified and post-hoc analysis with the dose response correlation for BNS in patients with epilepsy. So this is how it looks. This is the pacemaker. This is the vagal uh, nerve, you know, you can you, you roll around it and that is how this is a positive and the negative electrode and how you enter it. I just show you some, uh, this is uh, how you make an incision here. This is the pacemaker, this is the neck. And this is how you uh, negotiate the wire subcutaneously. This is how you uh, add on the pacemaker and then you insert the pacemaker. This is how you put it along, around the vagus now. So theoretically or you know, schematically, this is how it rolls, uh, it uh, entangles the vagus now and this is how it looks like. What are the other non-invasive treatments? You have radio surgery. Modality gamma knife or cyber knife has been tried. 20 to 25 gray has been given completely non-invasive, but many patients have clusters of seizures during the period when it has not, because it takes a long time to affect, we know, gamma knife or cyber knife in any, any case. So effects on epilepsy can take even up to one year. Stereotect radio frequencies, again, another modality, stereotactic procedure, occipital approach is usually used, non-invasive straight or curved electric grocery use, disadvantage of listening, misplaced lids, working it's in a black box. You don't know, it's not, you don't see it. Irreversible biology of tissue hitting is there. That uh, risk is always there. Laser ablation is a newer one. Newer infrared laser ablation system is being described, 1.6 mm diameter, electrical to ellipsoid light, Distribution the tissue along the axis of the diffusing element, real time MRI thermometry and ablation zone predict. So, this is how an LIIT work, and this has uh, come very much into vogue these days. So, if you consider both, you said this is much better because MRI thermometry control is a real time visualization narrow transit zone. And last, and this is the last of the modality. This is called responsive nerve stimulation. We don't have any in India so far, and uh, it's uh, done in the US. It's uh, FDA approved, and the stimulator, the, this stimulator automatically triggers electrical stimulation when specific ecology characteristics as programmed by the clinician is detected. It usually works in partial epilepsy. This is how it is diagrammatically. And uh, this is how it looks. This is how you make an incision. You do a craniotomy and then you place it, you place it and then you connect it. And so this is a study in 2015. This was a pilot study. I think the RNA system is the first direct brain responsive neurostimulator acute and sustained efficacy. Safety were demonstrated in adults with medical refractory partial onset seizure arising from one or two foci and followed it up for 24.5.4 years. The experience shows that this is a very uh, viable treatment for, but it is highly costly and it's not yet available except in US. Last is the brain stimulation, which is also done, but the indications are very less. They are done very less, not like in Parkinson's, you know, everyone is doing epilepsy, it's very less. And these are the nucleus which have been tried, intranucleus, centromedian, subthalamic, caudate, cerebellar hippocampus, but most commonly done in the intranucleus of the thalamus. So with this, I come to the end of uh, all the, I, I hope I covered most of the surgical aspects. And this is... Uh, and the surgical, this was in 2018. Now I have almost around 250 cases experience and all are in good scissor outcome. I will show my complications. I had almost a minor as well as major. One case, of course, landed up in hemiplegia in the temporal group. And some minor complications are there, which is always part and parcel. And as you evolve with the surgery, your 
what I want to say that your skills also improve and the complication rate definitely goes down. So with this, I like to end. This were my complication place. Some transient hemiparesis quadrant and are all described. And um, it's like you have to, if there are roses, there are thorns as well. Now this, so re, if you what what about the literature? What the literature says about the reoperation or recurrence? Reoperation after failure of uh, reoperation after failure failed receptive epileptic surgery led to approximately seventy percent long term schizophrenia and reasonably neural psychological outcome. There is an increased risk of permanent postoperative neurological deficit taken into consideration when counseling for your So re-operation is also not very bad. And this was done in the recent study, which was done in the patients. And then you can, if you re-operate even, you can give up to 70% long-term seizure outcome. So I'll end up with this small case of a positive complication of an epilepsy surgery. In kids, they do marvelous. You know, they will be there, catch up with the cognitive measures and they decrease. This was a boy, which is very close to my heart and I always show in my presentations. He was a very, very, very difficult kid. He was having seizure every five minutes and dropping on the grounds. Decrease in hyperactivity and aggressive behavior in case of children with seizure freedom is known. So this was a boy who, when he was came to us and was for surgery, he was having seizure every five minutes and he was drowsy. By the time he finishes one seizure, the other seizure starts. So this was very difficult. He had a left spastic hemiparesis already. Who have been surgressed, visual acuity was six by nine and visual non copy width. This was his sleep EEG, and this was his. I'll not show the video. And this is how he used to lie down most of the time because the moment he gets up, he again has a different season. So we did um, this is how it was, and this was the MRI. And you can see that the whole lobe is diseased. We did a hemispherotomy in this case, and then post surgery. Uh, it was one month post surgery, and he started walking. He started speaking, and speaking completely, which it was like the parents were really, really grateful. And he had a mild facial paralysis post. He used to remain drowsy in the initial five, six months, and. Uh, this was a very gratifying, this remains a very gratifying surgery in children when you do oh, the hemispherotomy yeah. and you see that a child which is throwing scissors every five minutes become completely awesome. all right, you know, you get a lot of blessings from the parents. And this is after three years and now, and this is after three years, I would like to say that this boy who was not able to speak nothing and now he's among the first five rankers in the class. And whenever he comes, you know, he will just show his report card and say that I've scored this. So, you know, it's very gratifying surgery if you have the correct, correct, you know, selected patients, it gives a very gratifying reason. So with this, I will stop here. The take home message remains, epilepsy surgery is not a last resort, but should be an early resort because of its huge benefit, both in terms of quality of life and economy even if it fails redo surgery has also shown good results should be a part of neurosurgical practice in more and more centers thank you thank you very much Shukandra. Uh, before we turn over to uh Ip and mana so uh, a, bit of, a bit of housekeeping a bit of housekeeping please mind your mute button and you can uh, if you have good bandwidth you can ask questions but if you don't have good bandwidth just Post the questions in the chat, and we'll try to get to them. And uh, Manas, do you want to take over from here? Yeah. Uh, uh, All right. Yeah. Put it, okay, go ahead. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Suchanda, for giving an um, exhaustive uh, uh, overview of the different types of epilepsy surgery. Um, mm -hmm. We'll start with the question uh, from your last slide. Uh, as you have shown that uh, it, it has a very good cognitive outcome, like the child uh, from a child who was bedridden and became the topper in the class. Uh, there's a question from Dhaka Medical College by Dr. Suzanne, and he has asked, uh, what is the post-operative uh, cognitive and memory decline after temporal and frontal lobectomy? Yes. Fresh your answer. Yeah, so... This is reported, this is reported, but uh, we are actually right now analyzing our series, but we don't find them very significant. You know, there are 
if you do it correctly i think uh, it's very minimal most of them are actually uh, do not add up to the memory deficit more whatever they have they, they get stabilized over there only yeah means it's uh, if it's a right side temporal lobe they do not have much of effect it's only a left temporal lobe some yes. of them develop memory deficit uh, but uh, many of them have uh, they improve in their cognitive and and iq because they they if the recurrent seizures are stopped the damage because of recurrent seizures uh, has been avoided so that itself gives a positive outcome following epilepsy surgery uh, he again has asked what do you mean by endoscopic assisted uh, hemispherectomy endoscopic <laughs> assisted is like uh, we we do with microscope here you use an endoscope and instead of microscope you can make a little smaller incision and with the help of an endoscope you can do the whole surgery it's little time taking but uh, you know you can just minimize the craniotomy and everything when you use an endoscope That's yeah the size of craniotomy can be reduced and and it's a better visualization it's something uh, the similarity between doing a microscopic pituitary and endoscopic pituitary uh, at the end you achieve excision of the pituitary tumor but uh, the visualization is better in in and pit uh, endoscopic procedure this is a question from dr chirag patel from hyderabad uh, see he has asked that uh, can hypothalamic hematoma be done through a transcolossal approach or how do you decide when to do transcolossal when to do uh, transcelvian uh we it's mostly done through a trans uh, i have no experience by doing on a transcolossal approach and i think it will be difficult to do through a transcolossal approach that's all i i can say but i i really don't have any experience on doing through a transcolossal approach either. uh it at it probably depends on on, on the where it um, is, yeah. on where it huh? is located on where it is yeah. located it depends on where it is located but mostly they come from the posterior part of the hypothalamus so you know it's difficult to to get to the transcolossal yeah but the the people also have done endoscopic uh, uh, excision of uh, an endoscopic disconnection also and it is done through the trans uh, ventricular approach so if some is is hanging from the floor it is transtirional and if it's a large one uh, right. pointing near the anterior anterior part it is a transylvian but in the posterior part then it is a transcolossal when uh, can you hear me yeah yes yes Uh, yeah hello i i joined up a bit late i hello. i wanted to ask sujanda um, completely unrelated question so you were talking about laser ablation with mr thermometry apparently Sorry? we have you were talking about laser ablation with mr yes, thermometry yes after the laser ablation what happens in the post operative scans i mean uh, do you know what happens to the post operative scans for that tissue which is ablated what happens uh, to that tissue and uh, i mean i am interested in using it for tumor uh, i was wondering if there it would work for tumor because if it works for normal tissue it should work for tumor it does work. there are a lot of series coming out for pilocytic astrocytoma and all you know from the us they have a uh, few centers are doing and they have already published the report on dnt and pilocytic astrocytoma i personally i just put it but i don't have my experience on that so you know because it's ablated like like it works in dbs it works here as well Mm -hmm. yeah many centers in us have used uh, the laser uh, for uh, multiple metastases and mm -hmm. uh, uh, small uh, recurrence of gbms also so um, uh, since, since you cannot do a real time mr i mean unless you are in an open mr yeah uh, so how do you assess uh, that what amount is getting damaged do you know about this manas yeah mm -hmm. uh, because you do a stereotactic means it, it it all depends on uh, because in the mr they do a thermography and from the thermography you can make out what is the temperature at each level and uh, so the and you decide the amount of destruction depending on the temperature so the laser energy what is delivered depends uh, you decide on 
how much of the tissue uh, has to be uh, destroyed I mean, so has to be done. has that yes. red zone green zone yellow zone you know as uh, you go further from the leash and you know the laser th that is being depicted in the uh, in the mr thermography the yeah it would be very interesting instead of embolization if one could go and boil a petroclival or boil a falcotentorial tumor first and then go in and take out the tumor this would be fantastic you know i mean if it could be done as a control procedure instead of embolization um, yeah but laser has a limitation of the size uh, one can only do for uh, smaller size uh, tumors uh, not the bigger size ones so maybe that... multi maybe multiple points maybe multiple points yeah it can be done multiple points Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, we don't know about the you know vascularity because it takes a huge time. Those are huge relations, isn't it? Falco tentorial and also the small mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Ali has asked a question for Doctor Suchanda. He has asked uh, when you are operating on eloquent area, how do you decide the number of uh, MSTs? So it has to cover the whole gyrus actually. If you are doing on that part, and there will be gyrus. It it will correct from one one end of the sulcus to the other end of the sulcus. You meet at five mm intervals the whole of the gyrus, and then of course you have your ECOG to say that when you have to stop it. Yeah, no, he is asking that how how what is the area of MST you will do? How much the surface area? Yeah, the surface area is like five millimeter squares. At the whole gyrus has to be covered. You have to cut the one particular gyrus, which is the elephant. Suppose you take the motor cortex, the whole particular area which you think is the epileptogenic area, you will do it, but you will do from one circus to the other circus. The whole gyrus will do it at five mm intervals. I, yeah, I don't know if I'm clear or not. Uh, Dr. Mohammed has asked that. Uh, uh, how many years one should uh, wait before suggesting surgery? He wants a definition of the refractory. Uh, when do you decide for surgery? After how yeah, many years of medical treatment? The, yeah, year, earlier the rule was of two, like two years, two drugs for, you know. Um, but now it is not like that. You give appropriate uh, to, I mean, a broad spectrum anti-epileptic. And then if the patient doesn't r respond, you can go in after six months as well. That's what the ILA says. Yeah, uh, I mean, as far as I uh, understand that if it's an adult patient, uh, the role of two years, like uh, give two drugs in adequate dose and yes. for uh, two years, and if it's not controlled, and if it continues to get more than two seizures per month, then mm -hmm. it's intractable. And if it's less than two years child, one can take the criteria of six months. Of six months. Yeah. Uh, they want a comment of yours that, uh, why epilepsy surgery is done at the last? Should epilepsy surgery be considered uh, long before trying multiple medication? What do you think the future of epilepsy surgery? Should it be done very early? Like early uh, DBS people have started doing early stim at two years. Earlier they were taking five years. So should we wait for two years as intractable or should we go ahead after two months, three months? So in children is more or less defined, you know, with cat catastrophic epilepsies, uh, it's no point going on adding drugs after drugs and giving the side effects of the drugs. You go straight ahead for surgery because it has been proved ample times that the results are very good. So you go pretty, like in infants also you are doing for catastrophic epilepsy or hemispheric epilepsy. You go early, but in adults you have to give uh, some time for the drugs and that's what like uh, the criteria is six months, but most most of the time now the, the criteria are coming down, you know, the, like uh, you don't wait for so long. If you see that major ep anti-epileptic drugs are not working in the patient. It, it all depends on the patient's uh, expectation and patient's uh, uh, what is it as a job doing. And uh, depending uh, on that also one can reduce the, you need not wait for two years. Uh, Dr. Sudhakar has asked you, do you do neuropsych evaluation as a part of the surgical evaluation? Yes, it is mandatory to do a neuropsych evaluation before taking the patient for surgery. Yeah, Dr. Z Dr. Musa has asked how uh, after surgery, when do you stop anti-epileptic anti medication and what is the recurrence rate after stopping medical treatment? See the medical part, like you go on continuing the anti-epileptic and over a period of time, over a six, 
months period of time the gradually one by one the drug is being stopped and then the when and then of course then it's the neurologists who come into the picture the surgeons are not doing that the neurological league does that and when they don't have scissor for more or less around two years they continue after that they sometimes completely they remove in a classical anterior mesial temporal lobectomy but actually they remove one by one and then see the response and then they consider removing but in case of extra temporal always they keep on one drug they not that they completely remove the uh, all the drugs yeah if only 50% of the time you can uh, uh, patients can be totally off drug 50% of the patient they still need to continue drugs of the patients uh, who have are seizure free now what is the risk of massive dr uday gupta has asked what is the risk of massive infarcts or cerebral edema so that's why i mean uh, sometimes it happens of course i did not have that so far but that were all common earlier when you know you did a massive resective surgery but now with the disconnective surgeries in vogue you don't uh, get those massive edemas or infarcts so uh, time is out but we have the last question for you uh, how do you identify choroidal artery while doing temporal lobectomy so the choroidal artery you don't you see you don't see it actually it remains below the pia so you know you know where the amygdala hippocampal um, connection is there it lies just under that part so they are very fragile arteries and you have to be very careful that's why you don't uh, disrupt the pia because if you disrupt the pia and there is a bleeding it is potentially very likely to be a choroidal artery they are very end arteries uh, they are very small thin arteries which remains in anterior to the Choroidal point. Yeah, the choroidal point. One has to be very careful for yes. the choroidal artery. Um, uh, as we are short of time, and then we have, uh, so I'll uh, I'll request Dr. Bennett to take over. And uh, thank you, Dr. Suchanda, for uh, uh, giving you. a very good explanation for all the questions. Also, uh, if anybody else has question, they can unmute unmute their speaker and ask. Anybody else has more questions, Dr. I P. Dr. Cherian. Hello, Suchinda. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Nice to hear your talk, and it was a very informative and very uh, lucidly explained all the procedures. Incidentally, uh, we at Udaipur have also started with the uh, our very few baby steps we have taken for starting epilepsy surgery. and we have done about 20 cases with the help of uh, experts operating operator from elsewhere i have uh, got a question for how many cases are done in your center and uh, is there any particular days are fixed for your epilepsy surgeries or you have some cluster of cases then you do those cases uh, mainly it's because just to gain some information about visiting your center and uh... yeah the reason is uh, you know we have to do uh... everything together and with resource constraint and everything in a government setup we are able to do around 30 to 35 a year so in a monthly like it remains 3 3 average a year i cannot do more than that because the day will picks up an epilepsy and any reason will crop in so you know obviously the preference yes but we try to do at least three but it, it's not the number if you do 20 cases in a year you you are considered as an epilepsy surgery center right So uh, it works out like if you do two cases a month, that's that's fine to to keep on your uh, techniques uh, alive. Uh, okay, very very you, good, Professor Bennett. Yeah. Very good, Manas. Thank you very much for stepping in and moderating, yeah. and thank you, Sukhandra, uh, and thanks to all the panelists. So uh, uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. Thanks, everybody. Stay here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the initial. No, it's all right. It's, it's, a, it's a new technology, you know, to a lot of people. You know, it's you know, know. And, and just you just started. So uh, let me just add. We're kind of off camera now. We're going to edit this out. But Atul, are you there? Because uh, John, John, yes, he's no. having yeah, yeah he's hi. having yeah hi. He's having some trouble with the internet. He's just coming back shortly. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll just we'll just, just stay we'll just yeah, stay here and wait for him to come. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Very good. Hello, Abida. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine. Hi. Hi, Abida. Hi, Sujan. Hi, Sujan.
Oh. Excuse me, I have a question for uh, Dr. Shanda. Where she, can I ask this question? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. free your time. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for this clear and elaborate presentation. You uh, really you covered all the aspects and all the angles of epilepsy surgery in a very clear and interesting way. My question is about the temporal lobe epilepsy while operating on a lesion uh, on the temporal lobe. Do you routinely decide to excise the hippocampus and the amygdala? Do you do uh, amygdala hippocampectomy routinely with any temporal lobe epilepsy? Or you have some choices or some uh, factors to decide the amygdala hippocampectomy while operating on temporal epilepsy for lesions, lesional epilepsy? Yeah, I understand that. If your lesion involves the mesial structure, you, you, you do remove the amygdala and the hippocampus in general along that is recommended okay but if the lesion involves the new cortex small one then you may get away without with uh, removing the uh, lesion and seeing with a electrocorticography that whether um, uh, like you know the electrocorticography is silence or not though this is not a very but uh, in neocortical you have the ability of taking out only the lesion but if the lesion involves the mesial temporal structures you have to take out the amygdala and the hippocampus Hello. Yeah. Any further yeah. questions? Uh, yeah. We're just waiting for Dr. Goel. So the uh, floor is open if you want to ask a question. Do we have to do invasive uh, electrocorticography, uh, invasive uh, electrocorticography for uh, mesial temporal lobe epilepsy to make sure that the epileptic activity starts from the mesial side or from the neocortex, or we just uh, depend on the uh, corticography, uh, the surface EEG? Yeah, yeah, you don't require, in general, for a classical mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, you do not require invasive surgery. Only if you have doubts, like if there is a bilateral one, but, you know, those you decide pre-surgically only. Only in difficult cases, sometimes there may be multiple places where, in those cases, invasive. In a classical case, you do not require an invasive. Even during intraoperative thing, many of us do it, but many of us, many of the centers doesn't do it because uh, the pretty much the diagnosis is uh, achieved before uh, the surgery only with the MRI and the video EEG concordance. Okay. Thank you so much, crystal clear. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if it's a bitemporal or a pseudotemporal. Uh, then only you need invasive. Otherwise, it's probably uh, not required. Thank you so much. Atul is here. Atul, can you hear me? Yes, yes, John. Yes. Okay, yes. We're, we're ready to start. I'm welcome. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, good, evening, good, good evening. Very beautiful good evening. presentation. Thank you. Really, so I enjoyed it very much. Thank and you. Best thank wishes you. to you. You must speak more often on this program. Thank you. Blessings. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Best so wishes to you. Required, yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Manas. I heard your beautiful presentation the other day, Manas. I thank want you, to sir. see more of that, the second part of that presentation soon. <laughs> we'll do. Sir. Okay. So, John, you're ready for me? John? Yes, I am. <clears throat> so I'm going to, my dear friend, sorry for the delay. I'm going to present to you one of the most, most wonderful neurosurgical subject, technically, which is most profound, most difficult, relatively rare, and I'm giving you my presentation of three or four years ago now. Maybe I'm having about 36, 37 cases. So this is my experience in the last several years. So this is a rare tumor. And more importantly, it is difficult. It is dangerous. It can be quite a morbid operation. And it is... Uh, for the most benign tumor of the body, that is cavernous hemangium. Many issues are relevant when you are going to decide on surgery of these tumors. Most important is whether you understand these tumors. More important is whether you will be able to handle the bleeding because these tumors are very, one of the most vascular tumors of the body. 
these are not like cavernous angiomas of the brain stem and other places. These are not clot. This is a real vascular kind of a bloody kind of a tumor. And it is enmeshed into a very close cavity of cavernous sinus. And I want to discuss my story of cavernous hemangioma of cavernous sinus with you. The brain is surrounded by CSFs. And actually, like the fetus, it is floating in, like fetus is floating in amniotic fluid, CSF is floating in CSF. Brain is floating in CSF. So no part of the brain actually touches the skull base. The weight of the brain, in, if you hold it in the brain in your hand, it is about 1,500 grams. But in, in life, it is not even 45 grams because the whole thing is floating. So it is floating on CSF, that is one thing. <clears throat> and second thing, it is floating on the skull base venous circulation. And also the cavernous sinus takes a big part in making the blood, in making the brain weightless. So if you ask me what is the main function of CSF, it is of course all these chemical and you know, nutritional and all those things are hypothetical, but this is clear and right in front of your brain and in front of your eyes, that keeping the brain weightless is the number one function of the CSF. <clears throat> and this is what we described several years ago for the first time in the literature. You read any article on CSF, nowhere it will be mentioned <clears throat> that the role of CSF is to make the brain weightless. So our paper was, I think probably not the first, but the only paper which mentions that keeping the brain floating like fetus in the intrafetal life in the amniotic fluid, that is the function. So CSF and blood, so fluid, <clears throat> fluid makes the brain weightless and CSF and blood in the cavernous sinus is like a sponge. Cavernous means cavernous means sponge like. And the sponge is cavernous sinus. And sometimes this sponge becomes a little bit abnormal and this abnormal sponge becomes a very vascular tumor, and that tumor is cavernous hemangioma of cavernous sinus. The question is, there are several things that come into mind when you are dealing with this tumor. One is whether surgery is necessary or not. That is the number one issue. Second thing is, what are the presenting symptoms? Presenting symptoms are relatively very subtle in these cases, like only headache. For headache, whether you want to do this operation, maybe you don't want to do this operation. Sometimes these patients come with symptom of extraocular movement disturbance and diplopia, which is a very prominent symptom in these patients. And for diplopia, you will try to remove this tumor because this is the only chance of curing the diplopia. Otherwise that diplopia will remain for the lifetime. So to be able to treat diplopia, there is only one chance with the patient and that is surgery. This is because, this is because uh, radiation treatment, I'm not yet sure there are some people who are now talking about gamma knife and other things for cavernous hemangiomas, but several papers in the past have said that this may not be the best form of treatment. So surgery is the only option. So this tumor, you will be surprised to know that this tumor as cavernous hemangioma as an entity in the cavernous sinus was not described several years ago. There were only isolated case reports in the literature that discussed about cavernous hemangiomas. Otherwise, before the entry of MRI into the neurosurgical field, this tumor was not even diagnosed. And if diagnosed, the exact relationship with adjoining structures were absolutely impossible to understand 
and these tumors were not surgical entities at all. So these tumors, cavernous hemangiomas of cavernous sinus can be, can be mistaken as pituitary tumors. It can be mistaken as meningiomas of the cavernous sinus. For pituitary, your surgical strategy is different. For meningiomas, your surgical strategy is different. For cordoma, your surgical strategy is different. So you have to know exactly before operation that you are dealing with a tumor which is inside the confines of the cavern sinus, the very vascular kind of situation. Transnasal route may not be an option in this situation. And earlier in the history of these tumors, if you see, there have been several attempts to remove this tumor, orbitozygomatic osteotomy, orbital osteotomy, and various kinds of surgical approaches have been described in the literature. So we described our description about cavernous hemangiomas, of the anatomical description was the first. We described that these tumors are entirely within the dural cavity of the cavernous sinus. So cavernous sinus is frequently referred to an, as an extra dural entity. Cavernous sinus is referred to an extra dural entity. Some people refer cavernous sinus as an between the dura, as an interdural entity. Exact dural relationship or dural presence in the outside. See, dura is present here, everybody knows. Whether dura is present on the other side of cavernous sinus is not very well understood as yet. So these tumors are entirely within the dural compartment of cavernous sinus. That is one thing which has to be clear. And these tumors extend near the orbit, near the Meckel's cave and extend in the intercavernous sinus towards the opposite cavernous sinus. And sometimes they can actually go into the opposite cavernous sinus. But the pituitary gland, the dura around the pituitary gland is not disturbed by this tumor. So when you are going like this, you will find a very clear dura on most occasion, which separates this tumor from the pituitary gland. This tumor encases the internal carotid artery and also encases the sixth nerve. I will be talking about sixth nerve very soon. The fifth, and fifth cranial nerve, the third cranial nerve, and the fourth cranial nerve are on the dome of the tumor. Never you will find the third nerve inside the tumor. Third nerve will never travel inside the tumor. Third, fourth nerve will never travel inside the tumor. Fifth nerve fibers will never be inside the tumor. They will be around the dome of the tumor. So this is the most important critical step. Also, as I had mentioned to you that the fifth nerve has its own dural compartment, third nerve has its own dural compartment, fourth nerve has its own dural compartment, and they lie in their own dural compartment without coming into direct contact with the hemangioma. More often, the third nerve and the Sixth nerve are the more common cranial nerves that are involved by the tumor functionally. Third nerve and sixth nerve are involved by the pressure of the tumor. So they are, despite the fact they are sponge-like, hemangiomas are sponge, cavernous sinus means sponge. So similarly, this hemangioma of cavernous sinus is like a spongy tumor. You can actually compress it during operation. And that is probably the only way to remove this tumor by compressing it. So I will be talking about this tumor. The other thing is no matter how big this tumor becomes, it will, this dural relationship will never be altered. So it goes, see this is another tumor going near the intercavernous sinus, this dura is intact. This dura is clearly intact. Internal carotid artery with, will be within the confines of the tumor. Six nerve will be within the confines of the tumor. In this particular case, there is some kind of blood also in the tumor. So that presence of hemorrhage within the confines of a tumor is also one diagnostic feature. 
intense contrast enhancement. Intense, that is a very important diagnostic character for cavernous hemangiomas. Like I was mentioning to you the other day, internal carotid artery will be within the confines of the tumor. There is no other tumor where the carotid artery will be within the confines of the tumor, like other than meningiomas. Meningioma will be another tumor where the carotid artery will be within the confines of the tumor. Chordoma will displace the tumor entity uh, anteriorly. Uh, trigeminal neuronoma will displace the tumor medially. So this is one tumor. If you see such a situation, pituitary tumors, of course, will encase the internal carotid artery and the cavernous sinus. So it is important to differentiate these tumors from pituitary tumor. This particular tumor was my first tumor which I operated and I had mistaken this for a pituitary tumor. This was in the year 1991 and I had done transnasal operation and I now I had done a transcranial operation at that time, but I had gone for a pituitary tumor. But intense bleeding within the tumor made me back out from the surgery. And when the report of hemangioma came, I reoperated this tumor and then I resected this tumor. And this tumor resection was probably the first one in the literature where a total tumor resection was shown in the pre op and post op images. So even if the tumor becomes huge, you see, even if the tumor becomes huge, it is coming directly to the temporal squamous bone, but the dura will remain intact as I was showing you on the other day for pituitary tumors. Similarly, in, this, in these cases, the dura is intact, internal carotid artery is within the confines of the tumor, the tumor the dura is here, the tumor goes in the intercavernous sinus like this, in the Meckel's cave like this, in the near the orbit like this. This is another large tumor. You see there is some blood within the tumor. The tumor is going in the intercavernous sinus, going the dura around the tumor is intact. And uh, so we, these are very constant anatomical presentation and you should not miss it because these are rare. You may not find these tumors ever in your lifetime, but if you find and you mistake it, you might find encounter a significantly bloody tumor and your operation may go waste because you were not expecting blood. You were expecting some soft tumor or some kind of a breakable tumor. And when you land up with a huge blood, it is like a most vascular tumor of the body, I'm, of the brain. I don't know about the rest of the body, but about the brain. So you have to be prepared with blood and replacement of blood. You have to be prepared for internal carotid artery bleeding, which might happen. And today I will probably show you one case where I encountered internal carotid artery bleeding. These tumors, you see this tumor, if you do angiogram, if you do an angiography on these tumors, they are angiographically occult. There may not be any blood vessel feeding the tumor, you may not find. But the more, more important feeder is from the internal carotid artery branches, from the McConnell's capsular artery, and from the inferior lateral trunk of the cavernous sinus, internal carotid artery. That branch, these are the two main branches of the internal carotid artery, which feeds this uh, cavernous hemangioma and at the point of in lateral trunk of the carotid artery branch, internal carotid artery bleeding is a very common thing during surgery on these tumors. So this is a tumor, you see the constant, constant anatomical relationship. And more importantly is this tumor is entirely within the, these, whatever I'm saying, these, these were never known before that these tumors are extradural and this kind of anatomical description is not there in the literature. This is another tumor. You see the huge tumor going in the intercavernous sinus, going near the Meckel's cave. And it is not in the fifth nerve. You see fifth nerve is a separate entity and fifth nerve dural cave Meckel's towards the Meckel cave does not mean inside the Meckel cave. The fifth nerve has a clear demarcation in the wall of the tumor. You see it is going near the 
intercavernous sinus, internal carotid artery is encased by the tumor. The dura is present in this situation. The question that you will ask me is how to operate on these tumors. And that is the question I want to answer today. So in my series, there were, this was the old series, as I mentioned to you, I have not changed the presentation. Now my series is at least 35, 36 or 37 cases of these tumors. And this is a wonderful tumor. Believe me, when I see the image of this tumor, I get excited and I become happy that I'm going to be handling a beautiful tumor. So this is cavernous sinus. I will show you the similar, some kind of uh, anatomical descriptions which I have discussed with you earlier. This is the carotid artery, sixth nerve, V1, V2, fourth nerve, third nerve. And by the end of my series, I want the young people in the audience to know clearly about this anatomy of cavernous sinus, extension of intercavernous sinus, superior intercavernous sinus, inferior intercavernous sinus in relationship to the pituitary gland. So these tumors arise in the cavernous sinus and the sixth nerve and the internal carotid artery is encased by the tumor. So there is no question and somebody was asking me the question the other day, as to how to do these tumors and how much the relevance of anatomy is there for you, I must tell you that you cannot do these cases, these kind of cases, unless your anatomical concepts are absolute, unless your anatomical understanding is absolute, and there is no shortcut to doing these cases without doing anatomy, without studying cadavers, without extensively going to cadaver lab and doing dissection after dissection after dissection. So you, this dissection I have presented in my book and I have done in the year 1988, this dissection at that time wrote a description of intracarotid uh, introduction dyes and all were becoming very popular and we had done this dye dissection uh, introduction in India. I had this dissection in the year 1989. So 31 years ago, I had done this dissection. You see here, if you see in this dissection, there is a technical error. The carotid artery seems thinner here because the dye probably didn't enter or something happened. So this, uh, this was a technical error during that time. But now, of course, the anatomical and dye dissection techniques have become very beautiful. The other thing you see, if you realize in this case, not in this case, but there is a, as the carotid artery enters into the cavernous sinus, there is a big num number of nerves enter along with the carotid artery. I am not sure if I can interact with the people watching this. I would have liked to ask you which nerve is that which enters along the carotid artery inside the cavernous sinus, but that is a number of uh, sympathetic nerves which come along the cavern internal carotid artery that you must know and the lateral trunk arises in this area, in this area. McConnell's capsular artery arises in the anterior band of the carotid artery, and meningohypophyseal trunk is in this area. Sometimes the meningohypophyseal trunk also feeds the cavernous hemangioma. So meningohypophyseal trunk, see, and the cavernous sinus, this fifth nerve is in, in this area, in, in, in this, like this. So fifth nerve, and here above the fifth nerve is the Parkinson triangle. So meningohypophyseal trunk was a very common location for dural cavernous sinus fistula, and the Parkinson triangle was the first. You know, we used to even we used to try to open the Parkinson triangle to get rid of this fistula. Very difficult operation. It would bleed profusely, but this was the only operation done 30, 35 years ago for cavernous sinus dural fistula. The other thing I want to repeat that these are trigeminal neurinomas. They are within the dural caves of the fifth nerve, not in the dural cave of the cavernous sinus. Pituitary tumor have their own dural compartment, which is discrete. And as I mentioned to you, the dura of the diaphragm is elevated by the tumor. It is less common that the dura, the carotid artery encasement is also common in the pituitary tumors. Some tumor enter into the cavernous sinus, some tumors do not enter into the cavernous sinus, 
but cavernous hemangioma, which is a cavernous sinus tumor, never enters into the dural confines of the pituitary tumors. This tumor very frequently, pituitary tumor enters into the cavernous sinus as I showed you the other day. But the cavernous sinus There may be a slight delay due to bandwidth bottleneck. So just hang in there, just wait. Check your emails and may, yesterday was for five minutes, so it may be a bit of time, so, and he'll just jump back in when he comes. Yes, yes, John, now oh, you'll okay. be able to hear me. Yeah, okay, good, good, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Ca carry on. So cavernous, of cavernous sinus, you see I'm showing several cases for you to have clear, clear idea about these tumors so that whenever it comes in your lifetime of neurosurgery, they will certainly come. Many of you are very young people, I know. And in your life, it will come, this tumor, sometime. And if it comes, you must recognize and you must remember me at that time. Now, as I mentioned to you, this tumor, when even if they become huge, Extensions are very characteristic towards the intercavernous sinus, Hello? towards the mechanical scape, and Hello? they are endocrine occult. You see, not a single blood vessel you can see except for some strange kind of blush that you will see. So there's no role for preoperative embolization of these tumors. Some people introduce some uh, kind of uh, hemostatic agent within the tumor because they can bleed very profusely, so they introduce Dr. Ohata, my friend, had described some kind of a glue to be in, uh, introduced in these tumors before operation. I have no experience, but he said it gives you a good kind of a control. So symptoms are mainly acute. They come with acute symptoms of headache. And sometimes, they, more often, they come with symptoms of diplopia. Progressive symptoms are relatively quite rare in this situation. So the, these are the symptom complex and the uh, signs and symptoms in these 22 cases, not even 27. So headache is a common symptom. Retroorbital facial pain is the symptom. Visual involvement, corneal sensation is gone. Sensory system, Meckel's trigeminal symptom involvement. Sixth nerve is a very common. Third nerve is common. Seizures also in five cases. So this is my presentation from a few years ago. As I mentioned, my experience is th at least 36 or 37 cases. Surgery was done in 25 cases and observation, they were, you know, some of these cases, if they come with symptom of only headache, I don't remember these two cases, but if they must have come with only headache, and there is a big distinct possibility of damaging the sixth nerve in these cases, and if you are, if the person has come with a headache, you might like to observe because there is a possibility of damage to the sixth now, but sometimes the headache is so intense that patient will like to go for surgery. And uh, as I mentioned, radiation treatment is not an option. Extra dural approach to tumors involving the cavernous sinus was first described by us in the year 1997. And extra dural approach for cavernous hemangioma. This was the first article in the literature we discussed in the year 2003 that extra dural approach is the best option for these tumors. There were several comments from various people in this particular article. You see this cavernous sinus is an extra dural entity. These are chronic tumors. These are benign tumors. The brain is not tight. You see the subarachnoid spaces around the tumor are not obliterated. The brain will not be tight. This is not a malignancy or a uh, short-term tumor. These are long-term tumors. These must be present in his head for 10 years or five years. 
So the indications of surgery have to be very clearly monitored and internal carotid artery is encased by the tumor. This was the first tumor shown in the world literature with preoperative and postoperative images. Then this is another tumor which is completely resected. You see a, uh, angiographically occult and complete resection of this tumor. I will show you a video very soon. And this is another tumor which is completely resected. This is another tumor which is resected. This is another huge tumor which has been resected. You see complete resection. I will say complete resection. If you really ask me from my inner heart, I will say the, these are very fantastic tumors to operate, very beautiful tumors to operate, and you really enjoy this. Probably, unless you, you know, if you are very scared with bleeding situation because these tumors will bleed continuously during your operation. It cannot, you cannot have a bloodless field to operate. If you want a bloodless field, then of course this tumor may be very difficult to consider to operate. This tumor, the surgical strategies initially expose the cavernous sinus extradurally, then identify the tumor and then come around the tumor as much as possible, then identify the sixth nerve early in the operation and save it. This was another tumor. You see there is a flow-related aneurysm in this tumor. The tumor, the tumor encases the carotid artery, lateral wall is elevated, going towards the cavernous sinus, going towards the cavernous sinus, intracavernous aneurysm is there in this. So it is, you have to, you see the aneurysm was clipped long time, maybe 25 years ago, I published this article or maybe more than that. And you see this tumor was resected and this aneurysm was clipped at the same time. This is like AVM flow related aneurysm. So I'm going to show you one, uh, some uh, videos. I hope they run properly. You see, and the, you see the brain is lax and my exposure is not very huge. John, can you see the video? Uh, okay or no? Yes, because it's a little blurry, okay. but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it is a little blurry because the quality of the video is also not good. This okay. tumor I have operated some 25 years ago and the microscope was also not so good and great at that time. And maybe because I have not been able to edit my recent videos because of my location away from the hospital. You see this tumor, this area has been exposed extradurally. The dura has been retracted. And you know, almost very little editing has been done in this situation. Now I'm exposing the hemangioma within the cavernous sinus. You see the blood, it is bleeding continuously and it will bleed un and then I expose the sixth nerve. You see, this is the sixth nerve inside the cavernous sinus. I have to expose this sixth nerve and separate it out of the tumor very early and protect it. Because if I don't protect this sixth nerve, majority of this tumor, you know, you can, I'm, these are almost unedited tapes. So you can imagine many of these operations are done within 15 or 20 minutes or one, half an hour. See, and on the other hand, if you go on coagulating, I'm holding the tumor, going around the tumor, you cannot actually hold this tumor. And these are the cranial nerve, these are the, this is the fifth nerve fiber. I am working between, this is the V2, most important nerve to save is the V1, you see, and this is the internal carotid artery within the cavernous sinus. It has started, it is bleeding in the lateral trunk. It is bleeding, if you can see, you know, there is a blood gushing out from the, internal carotid artery near the lateral trunk. Very often this bleeding will happen. You have to gently coagulate in this area, then take surgery cell and keep the pressure. Then because of the size of the tumor, I have broken the tumor. And then this is the end of the operation. And uh, this is another case. You see, this is the tumor and this is post-operative resection. And this is the patient. You see, this patient had six nerve weakness before the operation. The six nerve weakness. And after the operation, within the hair have also not completely come. And she has complete visual recovery in the eye movements. This is another case. This is, you see, in the immediate post-operative period, you see the six nerve is complete. The dressing is still on. And I want to, I hope I can show you the video. Here is the video.
you see extra dual, this is right side. I am exposing, you see how I am separating with the right hand. I am relieving, I am dissecting the dura of the dome of the, you see, this is the dome of the cavernous sinus with the cranial nerves. You see the fifth nerve now, I am working within the, you see the fifth nerve I have separated and then I am working within the tumor and whilst dissecting, I am separating the tumor and sucking off the blood while separating. See, this is the internal carotid artery which has come into the picture. This is the right side. This is the anterior loop. Previous one was the left side case. This is the right side. This is the internal carotid artery. And you see with the suction, I am separating the tumor, dissecting the tumor. And this is the sixth nerve which I have separated on the dome of my dissection. And that is the most critical part. If you don't, if you lose the control of the sixth nerve and this I am going, this is the V2 division. And then I'm dissecting, this is the V1. And then I, this is the internal carotid artery. Just to show you a little bit here again. You see, this is the V2 division, V1 is superior. I'm working with between the V1 and the V2 division. And this is the internal carotid artery. So here is the another tumor, which is preoperative and postoperative resection. This is another tumor. You see how the cavernous sinus roof is elevated. This is having a distinct, this is in the internal cavernous, intercavernous sinus. This is another tumor going towards the intercavernous sinus. And here is the video. Let us see how I can show you. You see, this is, I am separating, this is the right, uh, this is the left side, left side. So I'm separating the dura of the cavernous sinus. The cranial nerves are within the, sorry, this is the right side. This is the right side. This I am working above the V2 division of the V2 division of the trigeminal nerve, and the internal carotid artery has bled now, early in the operation. So I am now going to get because now the bleeding has started. I will have to first get. You see, my assistant's suction has come in. It is bleeding quite profusely. It it will not. It should not bleed that profusely. But now internal carotid artery has bled. And sometimes you have to take a stitch, control proximal and distal clip and take a stitch sometimes. And sometimes there can be a larger laceration in the internal carotid artery that you have to suture sometimes. But you have to be under control of the carotid artery completely. Now you will realize that my assistant has uh, pressed on the artery and there is some surgery cell and I'm completing the tumor resection into the bleeding situation. This is the as I mentioned to you, you see, you cannot show like aneurysm surgery, a beautiful anatomy and beauty. You see the internal carotid artery is still bleeding. I am coagulating. You see the bleedings, the bleeding from the lateral trunk of the internal carotid artery. And you, it is a small kind of a bleeding and you can control it by smallish coagulation. I have told you, if you cannot coagulate, you have to control proximal and distal and then take a suture and then remove the tumor, saving the sixth nerve. And the more important cranial nerve is, that has to be saved is the V1 division because V1 division is the most important nerve of the cavernous sinus. Two nerves are very important. One is the, of course, the third nerve is also important. Everything is important, but whilst doing, because third nerve is on the dome of the tumor, you don't actually interact with the third nerve. Here is the left internal carotid artery. This is the temporal brain which has been elevated. V1 has been, uh, you see, working within the cavernous sinus. As I have mentioned to you, this will bleed. 
And once you have removed the tumor completely, there will be a gush of blood from the venous component of the cavernous sinus. And that has to be, that cannot be coagulated. You have to pack those areas of intercavernous sinus and you have to pack the region of various venous connections that you come by surgicel. And that is the only way to control the bleeding within the cavernous sinus by packing off the venous compartment, the venous drainages of the cavernous sinus that has to be packed very thoroughly. You see the extradural, you see the beauty of the extradural approach. And I have to tell you if you, if you think that there is any other approach and, and I must also tell you that these tapes are not very, very heavily edited, little bit editing. You see now I'm packing off the uh, intercavernous sinus and the venous component, the uh, inferior petrosal sinus and superior petrosal sinus can also come into picture, sphenocavernous sinus, uh, venous uh, plexus can come into the picture and you have to remove the tumor completely because these are like sponge. You see, they don't look like a firm tumor. It looks as if it finished qu quite quickly, but this sponge will uh, again become large once you leave the field. So it disappears, that sponge gets pressed. So you have to be very carefully remove all the small part of the hemangioma very thoroughly and very elaborately. And you see, if you realize I'm holding my suction in the right hand and the suction not only dissects, it removes the tumor and it removes, and it also, you see, this is the internal carotid artery within the cavernous sinus. I am trying to, as I mentioned to you, the sixth nerve has to be protected, V1 division, and I am actually breaking the tumor with my suction and uh, very heavy, the suction is a little bit heavy. The tumor may bleed quite profusely during the operation. You have to be prepared with blood and you have to be prepared with various kinds of uh, uh, things as you imagine with a vascular tumor. And so this is the pre-op and post-op tumor resection. This is another case of pre-op and post-op resection of the tumor. This is immediate post-op resection. I do a very small craniotomy, extradural approach. This is blood within the cavernous sinus. And this is another case where the tumor, this is also a very early post-operative picture with blood within the cavernous sinus. You see how the tumor is going towards the orbit, going towards the Meckel's cave, going towards. So if you have realized in my presentation, this is a very constant presentation. So you have seen, I have to just, in my 22 cases, not my subsequent cases. So this patient had a large carotid artery bleed and the artery had to be sacrificed. This patient had a later died. So you, I had death in my situation. One patient was pulmonary post-mortem, had pulmonary embolism, but did not die. And seven cases, rent was sutured in one case and other bleeding was there. Six nerve was could not be identified in nine cases. So these are my situation for several years. I am talking so total excision and postoperatively some was uh, left behind and le missed. So many patients will in improve. Only eight improved in vision in extraocular movements. Th three patients without eye movement disturbance had normal function. And rest of my patients had quite a bit of eye movement disturbance. So none of these tumors during my now 35 year of dealing with, not 35, maybe 30 year of dealing with these tumors have recurred or grew in size. So thank you very much, my dear friends. I hope you enjoyed my journey with cavernous hemangiomas of cavernous sinus. And I will be happy to have your questions, my dear friends. Great, thank you. Thank you, Professor. I, I are you here? Uh, I don't know if Ipe's here. Uh, okay, well, okay, we'll open it up to, to questions. Now, a little housekeeping, if it's, if you don't have good bandwidth with your connection, tech, please text your questions in the chat. And if you have good bandwidth, feel free to just to jump in and ask the question. So the floor is open. <laughs> okay, step up.
Okay, Three, we have to, in our neurosurgical life, we have to deal with good cases, we have to get, deal with bad cases, we have to deal with aggressive tumors, we have to do with malignant tumors, we have to deal with bloody tumors, we have to deal with calcified tumors, we have to deal with ossified tumors, we have to deal with skull-based tumors. So we have to be ready for all eventualities. That is the bottom line. Okay, I'll read some questions that were text. Go ahead, uh, does someone have a question? Go ahead. Good evening, sir. Hello? Can you yes. hear me, sir? Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, nice presentation as usual. I have a question, sir. Uh, uh, most of the time, we use the anterolateral triangle. That means the, the area uh, in, in between the V1 and V2. Yeah, yeah. Between the V1 and V2, not between V1. Uh, you know, many times, even above the V1. Above the V1 is a glue in a Parkinson's triangle. Sometimes between V1 and V2. So these are the two main triangles for this. For entering into the cavernous sinus. Basically, the nerves, the V1 and V2 nerves are expanded. So you have to find space between these two nerves. And then you have to dissect and elevate these two nerves and then enter into the cavernous sinus. <laughs> Okay, we have a couple of questions, Dr. Pasquale and, and Pasquale asks, do you control intraoperative tumor bleeding only with compression and suction? What do you think about Surgiflow use in this kind, this kind of tumor? Yes, yes, Surgiflow can be used and should be used at the end of the operation. More often I use at the end of the operation, if at all. Otherwise, you have to control venous bleeding by, of cavernous sinus by packing into the cavernous sinus space, that entry point, the draining points. Then you have to control the middle meningeal artery with coagulation. Then you have to control the lateral trunk of the internal carotid artery with coagulation. Sometimes you can have McConnell's capsular artery coming into the picture that you have to control with coagulation. And sometimes the internal carotid artery will bleed by itself. Basically what you have to do is, you have to first go around the tumor. It will be in a bloody field, but go around the tumor because many of the tumors I've shown you are very big. So then I break into the tumor. And then hurriedly, this is a sponge, you can get more and more space. I am telling you, don't be afraid of this tumor. Don't be afraid. At the end of the operation, if you like Surgiflow, you can introduce Surgiflow at the end of the operation once the tumor has been removed. But I don't use it. Basically, I control, I remove the tumor aggressively and quickly within 20 minutes or 30 minutes, by the time even the anesthetic may not realize that a lot of blood has been lost. I run away from the field by, with the tumor. Like, a, like I like to be like a lion who attacks and hits, not like a cat who keeps on playing with the tumor for a long time. Have you seen a cat uh, holding the rat? You may not have seen, but I will tell you how the cat holds the rat. You see, cat will not kill the rat in one shot. Cat will keep on playing with the rat for quite a bit of time, maybe for two hours or three hours. You sometimes you must see the cat and rat game. The rat keeps on jumping here and there and cat, cat keeps on playing. On the other hand, have you seen a lion hunting the deer? One shot. So I will not say be like uh, either a cat, be like a human being, but I like to go err in favor of being like a lion rather than like a cat who keeps on playing with the tumor. Attack. Attack is the key word in my life of surgery. Attack. And attack a little bit furiously. No blood. You see, what I will tell the young people is, know the blood. Know which blood will need coagulation. Which blood will need gel foam. Which blood will need surgicel. Which blood will need packing. Like in the tentorial bleed, you have to 
extract that blood bleeding site with surgeon. You cannot coagulate. Inside the cavernous sinus, this is a multitude of venous plexus. You cannot coagulate. <clears throat> you have to use selectively gel form in some occasions. Surgi cell on several occasions. Coagulation, if it comes right from the carotid artery or from the meningeal artery, then slight gentle coagulation. Coagulation should not be the main. You see, the problem with the young people is they think that everything can be coagulated and coagulate, coagulate. I will suggest, you see, there are two types of uh, surgery. One is that you will completely like to have a very clean surgical field. That is a good way to operate. And I will also like to have a clean surgical field. There is no way. But sometimes all the bleeding territories need not be coagulated. If you know which one to coagulate, which one not to coagulate, which can be avoidable, you can do rather quick surgery. I will give one statement to you, which you should not take for gospel truth, but I will tell you in my neurosurgery, I don't like to do any surgery more than one hour tumor surgery. No surgery more than one hour. And if some surgery goes, except for glomus jugular surgery, which involves a lot of exposure, AVM surgery is another surgery which will go on for a longer period of time. Other than that, no neurosurgery should go more than one hour. If your surgery is going more than one hour, acoustic tumor going on for more than one hour, you will probably need more experience and more beauty. It also, you know, and what statement I'm making now, don't catch me on this statement. If you have some issues, you please come and we will show you in the operation theater how to handle this bleeding, how to handle, how to do quick operation, how to handle tumor, how to handle bleeding. I would like to show the young people and this is my open invitation to all of you and I want to again make this statement. No neurosurgery should be more than one hour. No neurosurgery should be more than one hour except Bypass surgery will be more than one hour. When you do ECIC bypass, you take saphenous vein or radial artery, then you introduce, you go inside the brain, you go outside the brain, you expose the neck. That of course will take much more time. AVM surgery, of course, it will take more time. But if you take more time for acoustic tumor, other tumors, so that is my answer to your question. So I wait for some more questions from you. Sir, can I ask? Go ahead. Hello. Thank you, Professor. Hello. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. we see you. Go Thank ahead. you, Professor, for your presentation. Uh, I think so most of the, your case, you use the uh, pterial and subtemporal extradural uh, approach, yes? Yes. And uh, yes. what about the uh, approach by the huge tumor by transylvanian or small uh, uh, tumors by superorbital K hole approach? Yeah, Maybe. that is a very good question from you. Let me try to answer. You see, I have shown you that the brain in these cases is not tight. These are chronic tumors. The brain is lax. All the tumors of any size can be approached by a basal cranial, basal temporal and terional, basal terional and basal temporal craniotomy basal temper, an extradural approach. I do not, I am telling you, there is no need to open the dura. So there is no question of transylvian approach. There is no need. This is, my, this is the approach which I have described. And many people in the world are following. Second thing is to do a minimal invasive or small uh, orbit, small, you know, in the eyelid and all those uh, eye bro incision and all. You see, I don't, I, of course, um, for this, you need a reasonable size exposure about this big exposure. Can you see my finger? This yeah, big exposure yes, about, yes. about a complete ring. I don't like smaller exposure. I don't like orbital exposure from here. I like from here in this part of the brain. So, and coming extradural, I'd like to, another thing I would like to tell you is, I like to place the patient in lateral position and I also do lumbar drainage so that the brain can get laxed. And then my, re my retraction of the dura 
and my elevation in the extradural plane becomes more easier. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, yes. Uh, you Go ahead, Mohammed. Go ahead. Uh, enter a clinodectomy. Hello. Yes, we can hear. Yes. Uh, do you need any anterior clinodectomy in a big tumor? No need for anterior clinodectomy. I come underneath the clinoid process, underneath. And I expose the internal carotid artery within the cavernous sinus. So there is no need to do anterior clinodectomy here. And many of these cases, I actually forgot to show you the anterior clinoid process can be eroded by the tumor. I should have shown you in many of these cases, the anterior clinoid process is actually eroded by these tumors. And there's no need. I don't do. I don't think it is necessary. Sir, uh, do you reset a middle meningeal artery connection? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Middle meningeal artery connection. Very early in the operation, you have to take the middle meningeal artery. Because middle meningeal artery can be a big feeder. And you take middle meningeal artery, you can have a suddenly you can have a quite a bloodless field. And also I will like to tell the young people here that this is a difficult tumor, all right. But it is not such a great difficult operation. Believe me, it is a difficult, but, and you will love. You must not say, oh, I don't want to do. All those who are here listening to me, please. If you have, if you are listening, you must, you are, you know, you want to do complex neurosurgery. That is why you are listening. You must do this operation. Don't leave this operation. If it comes to your hand, if it comes into your neurosurgical life sometime, have the courage to do it. It will bleed, but you will be able to do it. I'm sure you will be able to do it. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Identify. Yes. identify. Uh, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, it's a very nice presentation by you, sir. I'm a neurosurgical resident. I have a question. When you explore the tumor and there is a, a very uh, high chance of bleeding, these tumors bleed profusely. So how you pack these tumors and identify the nerves? That is the trick, my dear resident. Maya, that is the trick. <laughs> you have to, when you when you will handle in when you grow up in your life of a neurosurgeon when you get operate more and more more and more tumors you will handle more and more bleeding you will handle in your life of neurosurgery you will know how to handle this bleeding also you should be operating on many meningiomas many gliomas many trauma extradural hematomas more and more you will operate, you will be able to learn how to handle. This is one of the most high-end neurosurgery. You will be able to control. You should be having your guts and power. You should be saying, yes, I will do more AVMs. I will do difficult AVMs in my life. I will control bleeding in AVM surgery. I will control bleeding. So I'm showing you some cases for you to be aware of these kind of cases. If When they come, you are a young Boy, when you grow bigger in your neurosurgery you, and when you do a complex case, then you should tell me, Dr. Goel, today I am happy and I did this case and you should be happily showing me, Dr. Goel, you were saying, today I have done a case which has made me happy and you show me in your life of neurosurgeon, okay? I will. Show and you, I will sir. be I will. waiting to see some cases from you. Now, <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay, Thank next you. question. Next question. Step up. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. sir. Uh, uh, you have shown us big, big tumors. Uh, how much we have to expose extradurally to start our dissection? Yeah, that is the thing. You know, externally, you have to expose nothing. You have to come. I told you that I like to come extradurally. I like to keep the patient in lateral position. I do lumbar drainage. There is no control. No, I don't like to control the neck carotid artery. I don't like to have intraoperative control on the distal artery. I don't like to expose anything. 
So this is a kind of a minimal exposure surgery. Minimal exposure, maximum surgery. So minimal, minimum exposure, maximum operation. That is my trick in these cases. In general, your exposure has to be complete. You have to be confidently doing this operation. Your exposure has to be good enough. So that is the answer to your question, Dr. Rana. Okay, next question, comment? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, can I ask, please? Yes, of yes. course. Yeah, thank you very much for your... Uh... You have become my friend now. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are friends from 25 years ago, <laughs> not just now. <laughs> thank you so yeah, much yeah, yeah. Uh, for your excellent uh, um, presentation. Actually, I use uh, just uh, very rarely this approach for extra... Um, for trigeminal neurinoma. And it's uh, bloodless and it's very easy to dissect. Um, my question for you that uh, we understand that the cranial nerves in the uh, lateral uh, wall of the uh, cavernous sinus, so, so it's uh, somehow protected. But what your explanation for in your series that you have very high percentage of um, uh, ICA laceration, intracranial uh, uh, carotid laceration, is seven cases of uh, 30. This is very high and it makes uh, the operation risky to make control and saturing. So what's your explanation? Yes, now I will, first thing I will explain, I will let you know about, uh, first thing is when you are doing trigeminal neurinoma and extradural approach, you must remember me. And you must remember my uh, interdural approach, which I showed you the other day. You must remember me, my dear friend. That is one thing. Second thing is about the internal carotid artery bleeding. Internal carotid artery bleeding will come from one point. It is not a huge bleeding. It is not a laceration. One bleed, one case, I had actually a big laceration where I had to suture and all those things. But it will be a small pointed bleeding in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus where the lateral trunk of the internal carotid artery comes out and it feeds the cavernous hemangioma. Now you know what, over the period of time, this bleeding will not happen to me because I work a little away from the carotid artery and I get this lateral trunk of the internal carotid artery early in the operation and away from the internal carotid artery. If there is any traction to this, there will be a spurter, spurter. And you can take coagulation and you can coagulate that. It is not a very, seven number is not a, very dangerous, means it was not a dangerously high bleeding, you must remember, except one where I had to actually suture. And if it bleeds, you, I have actually, you know, you don't even need proximal and distal control of the carotid. You can have proximal control just there in your vision. I don't need, I just do small coagulation and that's the end. It is, uh, that is the way I have to handle the internal carotid artery. And then of course the bleeding within the cavernous sinus you control with surgical cell. It is not like trigeminal neurinoma, as you mentioned. Trigeminal neurinoma is a quite a beautiful cavernous sinus surgery. You see, I am involved in cavernous sinus surgery for the last 35 years of my life. And cavernous sinus surgery is one of my most uh, fantastic, uh, you have seen some of my papers I showed you the other day on cavernous sinus surgery. It has been a very big journey with me, for me in cavernous sinus. And I love mm. cavernous sinus. And I enjoy doing cavernous sinus surgery. Trigeminal neurinomas, as I mentioned to you, is one of my, not one, it is my largest series in the world. I have of nearing 300 cases of trigeminal neurinoma. I have published a lot, 37 cases or 36 or 37 cases of cavernous hemangioma within cavernous sinus, which is also the largest series in the world. And there is no other series in the world big of 37 cases uh, of cavernous hemangiomas. So on the basis of that experience, I'm saying it is a wonderful, beautiful, fantastic surgery. We must do it. Uh, what know, about, sir, about, yeah, well, we, we, we know that there's a, there's a three, maybe uh, three important branches of the internal carotid artery in the cavernous yes. sinus, uh, feeds the uh, cranial nerves and the hypophysial trunk and the others can uh, easily be protected during this uh, massive bleeding uh, dissection? 
Don't say one thing is, you know what? Don't say massive bleeding and this. Don't use these words. This is a, if you use these kind of words, it is a little bit dangerous words, massive and all. You know, you must know that many young people are sitting here. If you see you massive, extensive, they will get scared. You see, don't use these words. They are beautiful okay. bleeding, a wonderful okay. bleeding. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you have to enjoy this. <laughs> and the meaning of hyperficial trunk will sometimes bleed. You have to coagulate near the, in, near the, in the region of Parkinson triangle. McConnell's capsular artery in the region of anterior trunk, anterior bend of the internal carotid artery. Lateral trunk, these are the three main, main branches of the internal carotid artery in the cavernous sinus, which are likely to bleed. And many of the times it may not, except the lateral trunk, which bleeds almost always, other arteries do not bleed so often. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. So, <laughs> enjoy the blood. First time I, I heard about the beautiful bleeding. <laughs> okay, next question, comment. Um, I don't know if you've been asked this yet, Doc, but how do you identify the sixth nerve early? Yes, that is a very fantastic question. I would like to know who has asked this question. Uh, Nikki, Nikhil Ka Kakani. I don't know if Nick yes. is he still, are you here, Nick, uh, Nikhil? Yes, sir, uh, I'm here. Oh, okay, Nikhil, yeah, you can, you can talk to the man. Nikhil, you have, yeah, yeah, Nikhil, you have asked a wonderful question. And I, you know, I really appreciate this question. And I can tell you, Nikhil, from your question, I can see that you were completely watching my presentation and completely you are not, a, you know, you are, you are in the business. Six now, as you can imagine, is the, it traverses within the carotid, along the carotid artery, but it is displaced. More often it is displaced by the tumor. Now, how to identify the sixth nerve is a very difficult and it, this displacement of the sixth nerve can be in various zones, like third nerve is displaced on the dome of the tumor. Fifth okay. nerve is displaced on the dome of the tumor. Fifth okay. nerve and the third nerve and the fourth nerve. On the other hand, carotid artery is displaced medially by the tumor, medially. So the best way to identify the sixth nerve is go near the petrous bone early in the operation. Go near the, near the entry point of the sixth nerve, which is near the posterior aspect in the region of petrous apex. You go in that area early in the operation. And also it is very important not to heavily coagulate in that region, in the region of petrous apex from where the Six nerve enters the Dorello's canal and enters into the cavernous sinus. You have to identify the six nerve in that region. And from that region, once you identify within the bleeding situation, then you, once you identify, then elevate the tumor off the six nerve. That way you have to identify and protect. And I must also tell you, and you know, that there are occasions in my own surgery on cavernous sinus where I have not been able to identify the sixth nerve at all in the operation. And in that mm. situation, you might leave, lose the sixth nerve. I'm not saying in all the 36 cases, 37 cases, I've been able to protect the sixth nerve. But many of these cases come with sixth nerve uh, weakness. And when I'm not able to protect the sixth nerve, more often the sixth nerve is very, already devastated by the tumor. So that yeah. is the answer, Nikhil. I'm happy to hear, get that question from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Any, any more questions, comments? I'm looking on the board now. Uh, Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, Uday Gupta here. Sir, uh, why V3 was not salvageable and necessary to salvage V1 and V2 only? What, what? So you said ki, uh, V1 and V2 can be salvaged and V3 can be uh, uh, sacrificed. Why was it? Uh, why can no, we no, I have not. Oh my goodness. I will not sacrifice any cranial nerve. 
No, you don't get, please don't get uh, Dr. Uday a wrong impression. I am not saying sacrifice any cranial nerve. But you know what happens is the V1 division is the most important nerve in this territory. Because if you have corneal anesthesia, then the saving of the, you know, if you have corneal anesthesia, your eye completely, it becomes, you know, you lose your eye. On the other hand, if you sacrifice, you, I don't say you sacrifice, suppose the V2 division is gone, mandibular division is not, you know, it is just a motor nerve. V3 is gone, it is just a mandibular division, it is maxillary division, it is gone. You may have temp uh, temporalis muscle wasting, you may have some kind of a chewing problem, but if you damage the V1 division, your eye is finished. You will get a white eye, sooner than later and the whole corneal opacity. So V1 division is the number one nerve in the cavernous sinus. Second number nerve is, of course, the third nerve is the king of all nerves, which has all the components of, uh, all the motor sensory, all components are there. Third nerve is the king of all nerves. But then the sixth nerve is also important. If you get diplopia, and if you get a lifetime diplopia, then there are some corrective surgeries that can be possible in this for the sixth nerve. But essentially to have a diplopia, it means you may not have the eye. You may just, you know, suture the eye. That may be a better option rather than open eye and have a diplopia. You understand what I'm saying? But if you have diplopia, some of the patients can, you know, with uh, can accommodate that diplopia and live with the diplopia. So sixth nerve, intracavernous sinus dissection, sixth nerve is important, but V1 division is an absolute important nerve. Okay, Dr. Uday? Thank you, did sir. You get my, Uday, Thank did you, you get the answer? Yeah. Thank yeah. you, sir. Okay, next question, comment. We have a couple. Yeah, yes, he hello. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, do, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes Dr. Said, yes. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor uh, Atul Gol, for this uh, very nice uh, uh, le lecture. Uh, did you see any spontaneous uh, regression of this uh, kind of lesion? What was that? Repeat. Did you did you did you see uh, some spontaneous regression of this lesion? Spontaneous regression. Uh, this is actually, you know, spontaneous. I have not seen. Neither I have heard. But this is a spongy tumor, sponge. And uh, during the operation, sometimes what happens is you have removed the whole thing. You are seeing beautiful anatomy, panoramic vision you get. And you see the intercavernous sinus. You can see opposite carotid artery. You can see, you know, uh, pituitary gland. You can see beautiful anatomy. And you have left a small tumor. You miss a small tumor. This small tumor can, you know, you do after new scan, this small tumor has become increased. So rather than regression, the sponge becomes more, you know, it opens up the sponge. I'm not sure by, you know, uh, by some bleeding, the spontaneous regression can happen. I am not sure. I don't think I have seen it. <clears throat> this Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question. Professor, please summarize the surgical indication for asymptomatic patients with cavernous hemangioma. No, no, for asymptomatic patients, my surgical indication will be no surgery should be done. And even for moderate symptoms, like only moderate headache or moderate symptoms, no surgery should be done. Because the risk of sixth nerve injury is quite quite a big possibility. The surgery should be done in these cases only when the headache is quite severe and which is a very common presenting symptom. Severe headache is a common presenting symptom. And then you may like to do, but you will have to explain to the patient very uh, aggressively that you might develop a, you know, diplopia because the chances of diplopia can be quite high. So, but you can, uh, you know, but if the person has a diplopia and has come to you, then that is the most beautiful indication of operation. Okay, 
is one from Dr. Select. Dr. Select, are you there? You you can ask a question directly. Are you there, Dr. Select? Oh, okay. Yes, Let yes. me Hello? go ahead, Dr. Select. Go ahead. Dr. I, I Go ahead, Dr. Slack. My internet, I'm, I'm... Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, the question is that uh, the such beautiful surgery, I like to know uh, what types of sakar you, uh, Professor Goel, you use uh, in this source of tumor removal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very... Oh, Dr. Salek, that is a very beautiful question. Beautiful question. And you, <laughs> that is a fantastic question. My suction is, you see, many of these bleeding op operation I do, and many of the other complex, even AVMs I do with the suction in my right hand. And my suction is a self-regulatory suction. And if you realize, I dissect with the suction, I dissect the seventh nerve with the suction sometimes, I dissect the brain stem with the suction, I dissect the sixth nerve with my suction, because at that time, my suction is zero suction. So I control my suction. I, have, I will have to show you my suction actually. There is a, a teardrop in my thumb and I do, when I completely close my uh, teardrop, it is a full suction. And with that full suction, I can break the tumor. I can demolish the tumor. And when, the, uh, when I come closer to the cranial nerves, I can dissect my eye sometimes, if possible, I'll show you some acoustic tumor surgery where I elevate the seventh nerve and the eighth nerve with the suction and brainstem with the suction, perforators with my suction, and that time I have zero suction. So I control my suction with my thumb. And that yes. I consider one of the most wonderful surgical technique of mine, where I'm controlling the suction and doing the surgery with my suction. Thank you, sir. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, Uday, my friend. I... Sir, as usual, yes, it was yes. an excellent lecture, sir. Sir, I've got a, a question that uh, you said that only this much of the cranotomy is to be made. Yes. And uh, don't you feel uh, find uh, that uh, this uh, orbital roof has to be removed to flatten the anterior orbital floor? or to reach up to the carotid ocular membrane and then we uh, or the tumor has already displaced or given you so much of space that you do not require to do this uh, flattening of the anterior for sub base sir. okay Uday, let me answer your question answer number one is i don't do orbital work i don't do zygomatic osteotomy i you must know that early in my experience uh, Hakuba, when he described Hakuba, was the first one to describe orbitozygomatic osteotomy, and he became internationally very famous. Professor Hakuba in skull based surgery, he was the uh, Japanese neurosurgeon, very famous at that time. And I was, he was a very good friend of mine and a very personal friend of mine. He came and stayed in my house. During that time, I used to do orbitozygomatic osteotomy quite regularly in my surgical business. I used to do petrosal approach, which was described by Hakuba. Petrosal approach was described by Hakuba. Did you know that, Uday? And he did, I used to do petrosal approach on a very regular basis at that time. And then uh, this petrosal approach was popularized by Al Mefti and um, you know, Al Mefti was doing quite a number and I describe at that time my basal exposure where I incorporated mastoidectomy in my exposure. Do, do, do you remember I showed you the other day? I did basal exposure where I elevated the temporalis muscle anteriorly, went along the root of the zygoma roof here in this direction. And then I did mastoidectomy in my exposure and went. So I modified that approach. So I did included the pit mastoidectomy in my exposure, which my, I described in 1993 or 94. I showed you the other day. Gradually, as I matured into the business of skull-based surgery for last several years, I have not done petrosal approach for at least 22, 23 years. I have not done petrosal approach. 
orbitozygomatic exposure i have not done for 22 years 23 years in my surgical curriculum my residents have not seen me doing orbitozygomatic osteotomy even zygomatic osteotomy i don't do see zygomatic osteotomy was done to elevate the temporalis muscle the bulge which will come above the zygoma but i described i showed you the other day elevation of the zyg uh, temporalis muscle anteriorly or splitting of the temporalis muscle which i described in the year 94 or 95 so i have avoided using uh, orbital approach and orbitozygomatic exposure so that is one second thing is these tumors the brain is not tight in these tumors brain is very lax in these tumors these are chronic tumors like avms avm the brain is very lax like epidermoid tumors the brain is very lax in epidermoid tumor because they are benign tumors and these tumors uh, cavernous hemangiomas the benign they are as benign as epidermoid tumors they are in the brain for a very long time only problem is they suck blood and they are bloody tumors epidermoid tumors on the other hand are bloodless tumors if you have bleeding during epidermoid tumor then is a wrong operation so that is the thing because the brain is lax you can come from a small exposure here you don't need to come from front as somebody was asking me whether i would like to come from front from here no i would like to come from the upper part of the zygoma in this ring and then i have a exposure like this here along the zygoma i will certainly like to expose the entire zygoma and then come along the skull base and then do this operation they so would you like to flatten the temporal fossa base yeah. completely completely flatten completely flatten the temporal middle fossa i will even remove some of the middle fossa floor thank you sir thank you i have thank a comment you, please yes. go ahead yes. go, go ahead I, I, as if you um, agree with me that uh, Professor Hakob uh, works on the anterior betrothal approach, uh, whereas uh, Professor Almisti work on the posterior betrothal approach. No, uh, and, uh, no, 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 no. I will tell you the history. You must read it because you know anterior betrothal approach was popularized by Kawase. Posterior betrothal approach, the betrothal approach, the removal doing mastectomy and along the sigmoid sinus was described by hakuba anterior petrosal approach kawase mm -hmm. and then uh, almafti came and uh, he popularized the petrosal approach mm -hmm. you must read mm -hmm. this properly okay yes okay thank you for your sorry what your comment about using the yeser gill control section is it effective or your your way is you, you find it more effective and during operation <clears throat> I like I like my own photograph. When I see the photograph, I like me, and I like you. When I see you, I don't I don't know about Yasser Gill's uh, suction. I don't know. Maybe I like to see next time you bring it. If you have, please bring your suction and show. I will try to bring my suction and show next time. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Tar Tarunesh asks, how to keep nerves under control if carotid artery starts bleeding? What was done by you? Did you get that question? It is difficult to answer this question, but you have to, con if you do not control, if you cannot take care of the cranial nerves, then this operation will be finished. You have to save the nerves. That is the aim of the operation. If you are not able to save the nerve, you see also you can damage the nerve i'm not saying you will not damage the nerve but our aim of operation is to save the nerves and to protect the nerves i have i started with saying that all tumors in our life of neurosurgery will be different there is no tumor in the body like the hemangioma what i showed you there are tumors like soft tumors like um, neurinomas like acoustic neurinomas pituitary tumors meningioma they are different cordomas they are suckable tumors they are different but this i am showing you today is a bloody tumor bleeding tumor
So this is a difficult tumor. That is why not many people in the world are doing this operation because it is difficult to control the bleeding, difficult to save the nerves. That is why many people in the world are not doing these tumors. How many people are doing this tumor? Tell me, do you know of any person who is doing, there are very few people who are doing this tumor, but I want you all to do this tumor. I want all the people sitting here and listening to me for last several days to do this. I'm giving you my uh, philosophy of cavernous sinus repeatedly, repeatedly. So you will be able to be able to do this tumor. That is the aim of my presentation. So is that if the tumor is extending to other side, can it be reached from the same side, one side? Yes, so how it can be. It can how be. You have, to, you have to go along the tumor and you can go. I have gone to the opposite carotid artery from here. And you have to go and expose. <clears throat> you, on the other hand, you can say, I will not remove the other side. You Then you, uh, then you might have a bleeding situation unless you remove the tumor completely the post-operative situation can be a little different and difficult. Okay. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> okay, more questions, comments? Don't be shy. This is a time to interact with a tool, which is not easy to do. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Um, hello, Dr. Guel. Uh, I'm Dr. Rania from Sudan. Thank you so much for yes, this uh, yes, great presentation yes, and this series. And uh, uh, also thanks for uh, Dr. John for this great effort. Uh, in fact, I have a question about uh, uh, um, a previous series, uh, a previous uh, topic from your series, uh, the AVM. If the questions of this session has ended, uh, it's about the steel phenomena in the AVM. Uh, is it uh, common? Uh, did, do you did you uh, face uh, 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 cases like this? Uh, what about the presentation? Is it different from case to case? Uh, I would like to hear your comment on this. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> AVMs are different. AVMs are is the last chapter of neurosurgery. I showed, I talked to you about that other day. AVM has to be understood philosophically. AVM is a benign problem. AVM can be difficult bleeding during operation. Controlling of AVM bleed is a dangerous situation. You can land yourself. You have to be experienced. The presenting symptoms are different. Some patients can come with only headache. Some patients can come with only giddiness. Some patients come with convulsion. Some people come with altered, um, worsening memory. Some people come with bleed. Some people come with ataxia. Some people come with visual loss. So there can be a range of symptoms. And AVM surgery is a very important surgery. Dr. Rania from Sudan, I want you to do this surgery. I showed you many cases the other day and I will show you some more videos. If I can show you, I have shown you some videos the other day and to control bleeding is AVM surgery. You cannot say I will not control AVM bleeding. You cannot say if, if you enter into AVM, unless you control the bleeding, you cannot get out of the patient. You cannot run away once you enter into the AVM. So you have to learn how to control bleeding in our life of neurosurgery. That is a very important. One neurosurgeon is different from other neurosurgeon. You know how one, I am different from others. Others are different from others. You know how? In the way they yeah. respond, when bleeding happens, how they respond. Some people will, you know, start sweating. Some people will start, the blood pressure may go up. Some people, the pulse rate may go up. Some people may fall unconscious. Some people will become more aggressive. Some people will become, you know, scared. So you have to find out. Some people will take cautery in their hand and start burning everything that comes into picture. Some people will take a gauze piece or a mop and put inside the head. Some people will take a bed sheet and put inside the head. So how one person responds to blood and furious bleeding 
will determine how wonderful surgeon you are. So you be prepared to handle blood, okay? That is my message. Okay, to the beautiful blood. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any next question, comment? Uh, I'm sure there are more questions. Let's see here. Um, hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, hello, Mr. Bunit. My name is Dr. Ahmad. I'm from Sudan. Welcome. Yes, uh, yes, Ahmad. Yes, welcome. I just uh, thank you very much for this beautiful presentation. I, I'm, I'm just having a question. Uh, is there any possibility to use cryosurgery or injection of uh, homeostatic agent like fibrin glue inside highly hemorrhagic tumor in order to control the bleeding and minimize uh, blood loss? Is there is any chance to do such thing? I will suggest, Ahmad, you work on this subject and you introduce this beautiful idea of yours to the world you i want you to work on this and see if you can use cryosurgery and reduce the blood and then uh, minimize the blood loss i will suggest that you take this project and uh, uh, if you are successful you please present to on this forum john will be happy to ask you to present i think it is a i will not say it is a a wrong idea or a useless idea. I don't want to use these kind of terms. I, I encourage you to study this subject and uh, because I don't know at all about this uh, cryo thing that you are talking about. Ahmad. Thank you very much, Professor Adol. Thank, thank you, Ahmad. Thank you. Okay, next question, comment. Step up. And I always ask Amy not if she has a question. Are you going to get mad at me today, Emina? No, thank you, but I have enjoyed the presentation. Okay, welcome. Okay, let's see. Anybody else have a comment or question? Okay, Dr. Goel, uh, we'll let you go on with your day. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's a valuable exercise for residents to hear you talk. I mean, it's great. It's really great. So, okay, what's the topic for tomorrow, Dr. Well, do you know? I will uh, uh, I will send you, John, very soon. Let me think about, okay? Okay, very good. Okay, thanks everybody for coming and stick around. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor.